Bydd hi bore da, a chloeso i gwyllgor archwilio iechyd a gofal digidol Cymru. Good morning everybody and welcome to Digital Health and Care Wales Audit and Assurance Committee. Uh, I'd specifically like to welcome a number of guests who are joining us this morning. Uh, Larry Jenkins, uh, Welsh Language Manager, uh, who is uh, attending her first meeting of this committee. Uh, and Laura Tolley, uh, Corporate Governance Manager, who will now attend the committee in place of Sophie Fuller, uh, who recently left for Patches, Patches New at uh, HEIW. Uh, Rachel Powell, uh, Associate Director of Information, Intelligence and Research, who is attending to provide an update uh, on Action A04, and Shikila Mansfield, Head of Workforce in OD. Uh, she's attending to respond to potential questions on the Internal Audit Workforce Review and the Directorate Review. Uh, just like to draw your attention to one other matter, you may not be aware that uh, Grace Quantock, the Audit and Assurance Vice Chair has recently stood down from her independent member role at the HCW. Uh, she's taken an up uh, a new role as the Vice Chair of the Citizens Voice Body uh, for Health and Social Care. And uh, I'll speak on behalf of the committee when I say we wish Grace well in her new role, but we'll also very much miss her contribution to this committee. I will turn to uh, other committee members then, uh, David and first Ruth, to introduce themselves. Diolch, Ruth. Borada, uh, Diolch, Marion, Ruth Glazard, uh, Vice Chair of the DHCW Board and Independent Member and Member of the Audit Board. And David? Uh, uh, thanks, Marion. Uh, David Salway, I'm an Independent Member and I sit on the Audit and Assurance Committee and also the Digital Governance and Safety Committee. And perhaps in the interests of time, I'll ask uh, other members, uh, those in attendance, uh, to introduce themselves as you present an item or make a contribution. For the record, I did meet with colleagues from both internal and external audit uh, before this meeting. That was on the 7th of June, and I'd like to extend my thanks to them for taking the time to go through the agenda with me in advance of the meeting. Uh, you'll be aware that uh, we are committed to openness and transparency and we conduct as much of our business as possible in open session so that members of the public are welcome to observe. Uh, we are holding this meeting virtually via MS Teams, as you'll be aware, but please note it is being recorded and the recording will be posted on DHC's website in due course. And as usual, today's committee papers are available for the public to access uh, via DHCW's website. Uh, you'll see before uh, you that we've a full agenda. I'll be assuming that you all read the papers in advance of this meeting. Uh, and I would like to advise committee members that we're hoping at least to have a, a short comfort break built in between sections four and five of the agenda. The meeting is scheduled to close at about quarter past 12 and there is no private session planned for today. So let's start then with apologies for absence. I don't have any for noting. Declarations of interest. Uh, again, not being notified of any declarations of interest, uh, but I will invite committee members to declare any interest now if you've got anything on today's agenda. No, if not, then um, I'd like to declare my personal interest as chair of the Moina Geiria Task and Finish Group uh, in relation to item 5.3 on the agenda, the Welsh Language uh, Compliance and Improvement Framework. So to ensure that we focus, that we are able to focus on business critical activities, so to speak, um, and those discussions, we are using the consent agenda for this meeting. Uh, are there any issues that anyone wish to move from the consent agenda for discussion to the main agenda? Now's your opportunity to flag that up. If not, then um, we'll move on. And I therefore propose that we note all items as requested specifically. We are approving the minutes item 2.1 from committee meetings held on May the 3rd the 24th of May and the 14th of June. 
we are noting the contents of item 2.2 of the NHS Wales Shared Services Partnership Assurance Committee from the 19th of May, uh, noting the contents of item 2.3, the All Wales Audit Chairs Committee summary report uh, that was held on May the 19th, and noting the contents of the forward work plan, item 2.4, uh, including, as you see, items scheduled to come to future board meetings and to this committee specifically. I'll now move us straight on then to the main agenda in section three. So let's turn to agenda item 3.1 then and the action log. As you'll see from that log, there were five actions captured from the committee meeting held on May the 3rd. All five have been completed uh, with the action as you'll see documented in your action log. Two are underway with updates included there. Uh, action uh, 03 is complete with the paper um, in the email sent with the papers for this meeting. Uh, Rachel Powell is in attendance to provide an update on action uh, A04. Uh, so are there any queries in relation to any of the actions that you've marked there before you? No, I can't see any hands up. Um, uh, and uh, you'll see uh, in relation to um, the action A04, the timeline, the timeline for four KPIs, um, data products to be produced and brought back to the committee. So I'll now turn to Rachel then to just provide a, a brief update, if you would, please, Rachel. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, we, we undertook an audit last year where that was one of the outstanding recommendations. And since then, we've been doing quite a bit of work drafting some KPIs, but also as part of the wider reorganisational um, changes that have been un been undertaken. We now form part of the clinical directorate and part of that move, we've been doing a bit of a, a broader review of how we incorporate um, better performance metrics as part of the, the directorate's overall um activity and we've been working with the digital governance and safety committee to ensure that as part of the report and that um we regularly take that incorporates more of those um performance indicators so quite a bit of work happening in that space but pleased to say that we have been um undertaking quite a bit of work as per the the recommendations from the audit and we are incorporating more of that um key performance indicator activity now in our reports going forward Thank you, Rachel. That's very helpful. Thank you for that update. Uh, and unless there are any other questions, um, we therefore note the status of the action log and the updates provided there. We'll turn then to uh, part four of today's agenda then, and specifically uh, agenda item 4.1, which is the internal audit progress report. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Simon Cookson, Director of uh, Audit and Assurance, and uh, specifically to uh, Stephen Cheney, um, who will go through the uh, internal audit uh, reports for assurance. So I'll hand over now then to uh, Simon initially to go through DHCW's internal audit progress report. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Diox Chair, uh, Borada, everyone, um, and um, <clears throat> Good morning from Audit and Assurance. Um, I'll very briefly take you through the progress report and then, as the chair says, uh, Stephen will take you through the last two reports from 2021-22, which formed part of the opinion that came to the last meeting uh, of the committee. Um, it's a short report. Uh, you'll see from page three of our report or page 61, uh, in the uh, committee papers that we're planning 14 audits this year, four are in progress. Uh, in fact, one of those around the recommendation tracker is just coming to a close now, and we're well advanced in terms of our work around strategic planning, performance management, and embedding the stakeholder engagement plan. And we now have another four reviews in various stages of planning waiting to commence. Uh, Chair, you'll remember that last year our programme was, was fairly end loaded to reflect the first year of operation uh, of the SHA. This year we are looking to do things uh, more evenly throughout the year. And in fact, we're hoping to get seven reviews, uh, half the programme to the October uh, audit committee. And we're well placed with that uh, at the moment. 
Um, so that's that's probably all I really need to say in terms of the progress report. Happy to take any questions uh, or comments on that at this stage. Thank you, Simon. Uh, any questions? As you say, it's a, a brief progress report and we certainly welcome the news that uh, uh, seven progress reviews will be reported uh, yeah. uh, at our October meeting. So um, that's uh, a marked change, isn't it? Clearly from our first uh, uh, year of uh, operation. Indeed, in which case, uh, Chair, with your permission, I'll hand straight over to Stephen, who will uh, take you through the key messages from both the workforce and the directorate review that we did toward the end of 21-22. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, as Sam said, these two reports are the remaining two from last year's plan, which were included within the opinion. Both were rated as reasonable assurance and actually quite strong reasonable assurance as well. Um, you know, we, within the workforce uh, report, we looked specifically at the planning process uh, within DHCW and how the requirements of agenda for change are being met and the recruitment scrutiny that takes place as well. And the overarching governance arrangements that um, monitor these arrangements. And, and typically we found uh, Good processes in place. Um, we looked at a sample of 20 new starters. We did find a couple of exceptions, but we uh, identified you know, quite good reasoning for this as DHEW was scaling up. The controls were strengthened as time progressed, so we were very happy with that. We reviewed the workforce plan and, uh, and, we, and we saw good, good arrangements in place there. Um, like all other NHS Wales organisations, DHCW used the automated process in, within track to recruit new starters. We did find a manual spreadsheet in place for uh, agency staff uh, or some agency staff and apprenticeships, uh, and we suggested that this be reviewed. Um, otherwise, uh, we looked at the recruiting process and whether this was undertaken in a timely manner. Uh, we did find that it, it did take uh, disproportionately longer than the all Wales average. But again, we recognise that there was massive upscaling in the first year and we were satisfied that this was being monitored and addressed by the executive team as a whole as well. So it, it, to summarise, it's exactly what we expected or hoped to see. Um, it, problems arise and they're being dealt with accordingly. And as time went on, we could see them being resolved as well. So um, I'm, I'm quite happy to take any questions with regards to that report before I move on to the directorate review. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And uh, clearly um, the workforce is one of our key challenges, like many other organisations at this point in, in time. So it is a key area of interest for us naturally. And um, we have Shikla, who is who is here to respond as well. I don't know whether you want to come in now, Shikla, or uh, at the end after questions. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to come in at the end, um, but overall we were really pleased with the, the outcome um, of the, the both audits um, and we've taken note of um, the findings and we're putting in action plan to address those as well. Thank you, Shikila. Um, I'll start with Ruth Glazer then, the uh, DHCW's Vice Chair. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Marian. Um, it's, a, it, it's a question about agenda for change, um, as I'm sure Shikla is used to us us discussing this. Um, it's obviously pleasing to see within the audit that we've been very compliant with the um, agenda for agenda for change um, piece. It, it feels to me though that agenda for change is not a good fit for us in our roles and it potentially it holds us back when we're recruiting and makes things difficult. So there are there are, there are there are two questions really. One, within the audit, did we see any evidence that the agenda for change made it difficult to recruit for our for our roles? Um, and then you know, I know this is a broader question, um, Shik won't be able to answer now is you know what what can we do is there any evidence we can use to to push for any change to agenda for change in terms of flexibility within recruiting our roles it's a really good question ruth um shikla would you like to respond to that now 
Sure. Um, the agenda for change, it's 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 something that we ha we have to operate within. Um, that's an agreement, unfortunately, within the NHS Wales. What we have done is we've we have started and nearly completing the benchmarking to see which of the uh, particular roles and positions are aligned to what the market is saying, and also within the. Um, agenda for change and we notice also as a team that some of our job descriptions aren't necessarily as up to date so that's something else that we're looking at quite quickly to update the job descriptions and sometimes the content of the job descriptions and what's been requested may not currently reflect what the the individuals are doing so it's about how do we review those job descriptions and then still within the agenda for change look at where they would actually sit um, I'm just trying to remember your, all your questions. Um, yeah, in so terms the first of bit it was, and maybe it's it, maybe it's uh, it, Stephen could comment as well. Is was there any evidence within the audit that suggested agenda for change is holding us back or causing us problems? Well, uh, if, if I may, I would like to answer that as well. The um, in answer to the question, we looked at the requirements of, of agenda for change, and they were. You know, satisfactory the sample that we selected you know 10 in total we we found uh, no exceptions with that which is what we would have expected we you know, um did sort of feedback on the job matching process as well which helps with that agenda for change matching of the banding however um whilst we didn't specifically find any um examples of where some may not have joined because of the salary. What I will say is that there are a large number of vacancies at the at the point that we completed the audit uh, within certain um, uh, directors or service areas. So project manager is probably a good example. Um, whether that's due to salary or a lack of a supply of a skilled uh, resource pool is another thing. We, we, we were unable to determine that, but certainly what we would expect to see in place with adherence to agenda for change, we were happy with that. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll turn now then to Claire Osmondson Little. Um, and in fact, the second part of your question in terms of what might DHCW do to push for some further consideration for potential change in this area. And I don't know whether Claire would like to come in on that, but I know you've got another point to make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you, Chair. Yes, and uh, this is something that's on our agenda through the management boards and through the local directorate reviews. It's something certainly we are trying to improve women in tech and encourage more women to join tech at all levels really of the organisation. So uh, getting that balance right and, and really addressing and making digital more attractive to other sectors of, of the uh, workforce is something that's close to uh, all of our hearts, actually. And, and we try to do that through um, through various groups, both within DHEW, but also working outside DHEW and with schools to try and encourage that, that uptake. Um, so I've got two questions, actually. Uh, one of those is obviously the scrutiny panel, which is something quite close to my own heart. Um, it was good to see that uh, that uh, the, the comments and actions around that, and, and we will address some of those. Um, the second one was really about, um, and a section I think is 2.14, about uh, how DHCW um, it seems to be a bit of an outlier in shortlisting uh, in, when you look at the All Wales average in terms of uh, when we get uh, the recruitment, uh, when we make uh, the advert, it's actually shortlisting and, and then undertaking the interviews, et cetera, which lengthens that recruitment process. I know that is something that Shikla has raised uh, in the weekly exec director team, but also through the management boards. But I think that is something we do need to address <coughs> within DHW, it's within our gift. So that is something that um, through the management boards going forward, we will focus on and really understand why it is that we cannot, once we've gone through the recruitment shortlist uh, and, and get those candidates in and, and interviewed as ASAP really, I don't know whether Shik, you wanted to come back in on that particular comment, but um, that for me was a really helpful part of the audit to really focus our attention in areas where we can make that improvement and in, in, and really start to reduce our vacancy position more quickly. Thank you, Claire. I'm sure we would second that. Um, Shik, Claire, do you want to come back on that specific point on the uh, uh, as being out, an outlier in terms of the shortlisting time span? No, it's, it's just to um, support Claire really that it is something within our gift to 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 manage and um, 
if we can um, do something with with the recruiting managers to shortlist within a timely way, that would be really helpful in terms of engaging with the candidates. Thank you, Sheikla. And in a very competitive recruitment market, uh, I'm sure it could only help our position in terms of uh, uh, recruiting uh, down the line. So it's really pleasing, though, to see that uh, overall reasonable assurance and uh, it just underlines how helpful these audits are in terms of highlighting some of the challenges that we have and uh, focusing our attention. So let's move on uh, to the directorate review then. Um, Stephen, again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, the directorate review is typically um, a sort of a hybrid type of approach that we do. We uh, focus on uh, one service area or, or a, a directorate within the organisation and we cover off a, a wide range of risks. Some of them may be workforce compliance, some might be risk management, some may be more procedural operational compliance. Um, for, for this year, we um, picked up a look at the workforce parameters uh, specifically because it's the first 12 months and we uh, focused on induction, uh, PADR, personal uh, performance appraisal and development reviews and uh, statutory mandatory training and, and, and the rationale behind that was um, sort of start as a means to go on as an organisation. So we were targeting those areas to hopefully give um, a good overview of current performance and allow DHCW to sort of target any areas of, of concern. Um, once again, it, it, it was reasonable uh, assurance overall. Um, we, we did find uh, some exceptions, uh, specifically when we did look at the induction process, uh, we, again, we selected a sample of 10, we looked at the local induction arrangements in place, and we looked at the corporate induction process as well. Uh, and what we found is that not quite a disjointed process, but um, sort of no necessary flow through or central records maintained of local induction records. Found that six out of 10 had completed corporate induction. Uh, of the remaining four, there was some movement of staff, um, but there was still a shortfall of everyone going through the induction process in a, in a timely manner. So uh, we sort of made uh, observation recommendations around that. Likewise, for the PADR uh, process as well, um, you know, most new starters will have been with DHC that will last in 12 months because of um, the, the timing of the set of the organisation. And But we were keen to, to look that, to see if those initial discussions are taking place around PADR objective setting. So whilst the 12 months may not have lapsed or indeed nine or 10 months for the PADR to be completed, we felt it was important that uh, at least objectives were being set for new starters as well. So we also had a look at that and we found a, a number of exceptions there as well. Uh, training on the other hand, um, whilst it wasn't completely 100%, we did find that um, you know, training was largely being completed across the board, Saturday mandatory training. Um, but we sort of raised recommendations predominantly around uh, PADR process and induction. So to instill those corporate values into new starters and to help guide them into a new organisation, uh, the induction process is key. And, uh, and likewise, PADR process is a fundamental part of uh, career development as well. So that was our focus for this year. And you know, whilst we raised some recommendations, we still felt there was uh, a good reasonable overall as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So um, overall, reasonable assurance there again. Are there any questions from colleagues? No, I think you've answered all our uh, questions or queries we might have, Stephen. But I'd just like to uh, come back to Shikla in case there are any final responses from you as uh, Head of Workforce and, and OD. No, um, I think that the report was, um, the audit report was really fair. And um, again, as Stephen said, we, we do take on the actions, uh, the recommendations, um, and we've got action plans in place to address those. Thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, I can see David's hand up. If I'm, yes, David, do come in. Uh, yes, thanks, um, Marianne. Um, Stephen, I just wanted a clarification. One of the key risks you were looking at was 
staff development opportunities not identified. Um, from what you've described, it looks like we've looked at um, new starters essentially. Uh, is there that, uh, and this risk for me is a key risk that spans the whole of the organisation. So, are you looking to pick up that at a, a future audit in terms of uh, staff that have been with us for a little while? Are they clear on what uh, career paths are available to them? Is that something you could comment on? Yes. Um, so, sorry, David. I, I, I probably was quite uh, unclear in what I said. Well, um, we did look at new status and we looked at existing staff as well, including coming oh, right, staff okay. that, that okay. transferred across. Sorry, I, I do apologise for that. But nonetheless, workforce is a sort of a key area that we're interested in going forward anyway. So we we're likely to be picking it up in a number of guises uh, over the next couple of years as well. Excellent. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, to draw this discussion to a close then, um, the committee uh, is pleased to receive the two reports uh, for assurance. And we will turn now then to agenda item 4.3, which is the Audit Wales Committee update. And I'll now invite uh, Nathan Couch uh, to present the Audit Wales Committee update. Uh, which, as you'll see, includes uh, a section on the structured assessment and that's been received for assurance now. So, Nathan. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, the paper I'm presenting today provides an update on our current and planned financial and performance audit work. Um, it also provides information on our wider programme of national value for money examinations and the work of our good practice exchange. Um, just to draw your attention to some key points we've raised within the report, um, in terms of work completed, um, our financial audit, you'll see that we've completed our work around the transfer of financial balances from Valindra NHS Trust to DHCW. We've also completed the audit of the 2021-22 uh, performance report, accountability report and financial statements. Um, the Auditor General certified those on the 15th of June and they were laid before the Senate on the 17th of June. Uh, my, my financial audit colleagues have informed me that everything went well, so I'd just like to express our thanks to the DHCW finance team for their engagement and support throughout the process. In terms of um, performance audit, uh, you'll see that our structured assessment work is underway. Uh, the work has been completed by myself and my colleague David Murphy, who some of you will already be familiar with from um, our baseline governance review work completed earlier this year. Um, the structured assessment builds on the baseline review by assessing the corporate arrangements in place at DHCW in relation to governance and leadership, financial management, strategic planning and use of resources, and that encompasses um, managing the workforce, digital resources, estates and other physical assets. Um, our intention for that piece of work is to present the report for consideration at the board meeting in November and to this committee then in February 2023. Um, in terms of plan work not yet started, um, committee members will notice that we will be delivering a locally focused piece of work during 2223. Um, however, we would not determine what the precise focus of that work will be yet. Um, we'll also be completing an all Wales thematic on workforce planning arrangements, which will examine how local and national workforce plan activities are being taken forward to manage workforce risks and address workforce needs. Uh, in terms of our good practice events and NHS related national studies and products, um, the update you've um, got in the, the, the papers um, provides a link to our previous and future good practice events for your information. And our report on tackling the planned care backlog in Wales was published in May and is a summary of the key messages, messages in Appendix 1 of um, our updated report. Uh, within the key section of within, uh, within within the key action section within the report, we mentioned that NHS Wales needs to secure opportunities to mess, uh, to make best use of new digital technologies as part of a re renewed focus on system uh, system efficiencies, which may be of some in, uh, relevance to DHCW. Um, finally, uh, just to update the committee members on the status of the WCCIS follow up report. Uh, we're currently waiting for it to be formally considered by the Public Accounts and Public Administration Committee on the 6th of July. Um, once the report has been considered, we will circulate it with the HCW, uh, DHCW colleagues and formally present it at the next meeting of the Audit and Insurance Committee in October. Thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nathan. Um, that's a really helpful update uh, and uh, particularly noted uh, the position with regard to the WCCIS uh, report. 
Uh, I can see uh, a couple of hands up, so I'll turn first to Ruth. Uh, Dale, Marion, and uh, thanks, Nathan, for that for that update. I just wondered if you could comment a bit more on the the the, the importance of digital to the planned care backlog. It seems. It seems all very obvious to me, I would say this, wouldn't I, that digital should be front and centre and should be one of the key enablers for dealing with for dealing with the backlog. And, it, you know, I think it's helpful that you've you've commented on that in the in the report. But it surprised me that it's not actually front and centre as much as I feel like it should be. Um, so I just wondered if you'd comment a, a bit more on your findings around that. It's a really good question, Ruth. Um... I wish I could comment on the findings around it. Unfortunately, I wasn't involved in the review, so um, I'm probably the, not the, the best person to, you know, to answer that question, but I certainly will feed back your comments and maybe come back to you um, outside the committee, if that's OK, um, yeah, around that. that. that is that all right? Helpful. I mean, I think we acknowledge how difficult it all is, right? And for, and yeah. for it, you know, it's, uh, it's surprising to me that actually we're not pursuing more uh, digital options in order to help support this because it's you know people resource money all of that yeah sure it, yeah, it that... just uh, it, it's it's helpful that you it's noted in the report is what I would say but it would be interesting to have a bit more um, context around the findings there I think yeah, I'll certainly feedback your comments to um, my colleagues who actually um, took uh, took you know took the review and I'll come back I'll come back to you something if that's okay great thank you thank you Thank you, Ruth. That's uh, a point uh, really well made. Yeah. I'll turn now then to our Executive Director of Finance, uh, Claire Osmondson Little. Yeah, I was going to echo Ruth's point actually, because when I read the report, and I thought it was a really good report actually, um, it was page 10, it referred to new technologies, and it was at page 25, digital came in. And I absolutely fundamentally agree with that point. Digital is, is an enabler to really address some of the back and planned care issues and it should be front and centre and equally it refers in the report to the funding and the fact that they weren't able to spend all of the allocated funds on recovery. I, I can uh, wholeheartedly say the return on investment on digital in this area would be an option that should be uh, considered, um, so I'd echo that. And the other point I would like to make, being a data junkie, was how much I enjoy playing with your um, second uh, report that you put on there, which I will try and find now in my notes which uh, really looked at the unscheduled care dashboard and used Microsoft Power BI to really bring to life the performance or lack of performance in some key areas by Health Board and Trust. I thought that was a really good um, piece of information that we could all use in, in our own forums to understand the position and understand the variation across Wales. Um, so from a digital perspective, I'd like to commend you on that. And, and um, I enjoy playing with that over the weekend. So uh, well done on that, that front. But it just goes to show that actually with that data and insight, how do we enable the use of digital to actually transform those pa pathways and care for the people in Wales and actually invest money where really the return and, and hopefully the performance would fall out. So um, thank you for that and well done. Thank you, Claire. I'll uh, feed back the colleagues. I wish I could take credit for that personally, but uh, <laughs> I can't, I'm afraid. So yeah, I'll feed back to co uh, colleagues. Thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you, Nathan. There's a strength of feeling here around the importance of, of signalling the importance of digital front, centre and end, if you like. Um, and I'm sure you'll take that back uh, sure. with you as feedback from uh, the, the audit committee here. So thank you. Um, Chris Darling. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it was just on the point around um, the waiting list recovery. Um, we did organisationally respond via the CONFED to the Health uh, and Social Care Committee. Um, and within that response, we did obviously highlight that we felt there should have been more in terms of digital transformation, digital options, um, and specifically around the long term financial plan needed um, around digital. So those two areas were picked up that way, but I agree the more we can highlight this um, through as many channels as possible, the better. Thank you, Chris, uh, and thank you all for those observations. Um, can I just ask one final question then, uh, Nathan, please, on the structured assessment? Clearly, we had the baseline governance review last year. Um, this will be our first structured uh, assessment. I wonder whether you could just clarify uh, 
how different or how similar will it be to the structured assessments that take place within uh, other health boards across Wales uh, uh, this year? Yes, sure. Thanks, Chair. Um, so it's it's consistent. The, the whole approach is consistent across all the health boards. So wherever we look at in DHCW, we'd be looking at in an Iron Bevan Health Board across all of the NHS organisations that we actually do structured assessment in. So it's very similar. Thank you for confirming that, Nathan. And I look forward to having uh, uh, the first of our conversations uh, in in a couple of weeks' time. I think. So thank you. Um, if there aren't any other questions or observations, then um, we note the Audit Wales Committee update uh, for assurance and look forward to receiving the structured assessment uh, review uh, at our meeting in November. So agenda item 4.4 is the Audit Action Tracker. Um, so I'll now invite Julie Ash, our Head of Corporate Services, to update the committee on the current status of the audit action log. And I'd be grateful if you could highlight any changes in the status of the action since our last meeting, Julie. Dioch. Dioch, Marianne. Uh, Borada, everybody. I'm Julie Ash, Head of Corporate Services. Um, so quite a brief positive report, I think, this this month. Um, so we're looking at the status of all recommendations that remained open. Uh, as of the last committee meeting, together with the new ones um, added as a result of the reports presented to the last committee. Um, so just to mention um, the following advice from internal audit, we are still managing one action um, separately because um, it's dependent on our third party, um, but pleasingly there were two and one has now been closed, so that, that's a positive step forward. So we did review 16 actions at the last meeting and we actually managed to close 13, which left a total of three open. However, we did receive a number of reports at the last meeting, um, which were uh, relating to the data centre project move, uh, the part two general governance review, system development and core financial systems, and they contained a total of 36 actions. So added to the three that remained open, that leaves us with a total of 39 uh, that we're reporting on, on at this meeting. So I'm pleased to report that 29 of those are marked as complete, which uh, again, very positive, I'd, I'd uh, like to share. And um, eight are on track um, for completion by the agreed target date. We do have two which have actually passed their target date, but I'm working with the um, these are both relating to systems development and I'm working with the applications directorate and we expect them to be closed within a month. So um, I don't think there's any uh, reason to sort of put forward a formal um, request for an extended target date. So hopefully we'll see them closed out by the next report. In the cover sheet, I have listed all of the actions that have been closed. Um, I won't <laughs> go through them all because there's quite a few. Uh, and clearly the action log is, is there for people to, to look at. Um, just a little bit of detail about the two that haven't been completed. So they're, they're both relating to training, actually. Um, so again, a positive, just in summary, positive 29 actions closed. Um, I'm just noting the two um, that we'll continue to work on. And I think that was probably all I wanted to say on the actions, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, and this report comes to us for noting, and it's pleasing to see the uh, positive progress uh, on a, a large number of these actions. Uh, any comments, questions for Julie? No, um, clearly there are a couple of bread actions there, which um, it's pleasing to hear that uh, action to address those are, yeah. are, are now underway. Uh, so thank you. Unless there thank are you, observations then, thank you, Julie, for your contribution. And we will turn to the um, uh, local counterfort annual report. Um, and it's my pleasure now to welcome Gareth Lavington. Uh, head of counter fraud for Cardiff and Vale, um, who is here to present the uh, 
uh, Counterford Annual Report for 21-22, the work that was carried out in the last financial year. So, uh, Gareth, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll try and make it as brief as possible. This report um, has been completed, as you suggested, in relation to the work carried out by the counter fraud team for DHCW in the last financial year. Um, it's been written in a different style than you probably used to in the past, and that is to, well, partly because it's my style of writing and partly because it's now in line with um, the new requirements that the counter fraud authority um, place upon us. So the key things to note from it, um, I'll, I'll come on to the actual work that was carried out in a moment and the figures in relation to that. But more importantly, I suppose, is the summary of compliance that I've put at the start of the report. The summary of compliance relates, as I suggested, to the new functional standards that the Counter Fraud Authority place upon us. So they've replaced the previous four standards, which were strategic governance, hold to account, prevent um, and deter etc and there's now uh, I think it's 13 in total 12 or 13 requirements that are placed upon us so I've carried out um, an audit essentially of the work that was carried out last year and and this is my opinion of the um, compliance in relation to those standards so you can see that they've been marked either green or amber as I'm pleased to say that I haven't found any of those requirements completely failing on red there are some issues that need addressing in the year um, coming up. Um, if I focus on the amber areas, so the amber areas I would suggest uh, have been in areas of risk assessment. So there is work that we need to do in this forthcoming year in relation to risk assessments for the organisation, obviously within the boundaries of our sort of um, days allocated. What I found was last year that there was a risk assessment carried out into pre-employment checks um, on behalf of agency workers, but this wasn't carried out in line with the new methodology um, laid out by Cabinet Office. So that will be changed this coming year. Any risk work will, will now be carried out in line with that methodology. And also I'm aiming and hoping for a sort of closer working relationship with the organisation so that we can identify more inherent risks um, or bespoke risks to the organisation that we can maybe do some work on in conjunction with the organisation. Um, other areas of AMBA that I've put down um, was reporting routes. I, I found that um, there probably wasn't enough engagement with the organisation and members of staff within the organisation probably um, not really that aware of us. I think some of that has been as a result of this sort of pandemic and not being able to get out and about like we were. This has been addressed and I'll come on to how we've addressed that when I when I come on to the uh, progress report in a moment. Um, and then finally, the, uh, sorry, detection activity I've placed as an amber that it's quite difficult for, for for us to sort of hit the green, I would suggest, with rela in relation to detection activity with the HCW, that generally is activity that's carried out um, historically, at least, within a health board setting in areas such as post payment verification and things like that. There, there are inbuilt systems within the organisation where checks are made across the board. So that, again, something that I can look, look to address with the organisation internally where they think that, 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 that we can possibly address that. Um, access and completion of training, that's that's been an issue across all organisations that I report for. Um, again, due to disruption through the pandemic, so the, there's a corporate induction has fallen by the wayside in most organisations. We're trying to get back on track with that. Um, and, and a key point really is the fact that um, staff members are not undertaking sort of fraud training that's available on ESR. And again, that's against across all organisations I report for. So DHCW is certainly not an outlier in relation to that. Um, but but that, that that is generally the case in organisations where fraud training is not mandatory, essentially, and it's not mandatory within DHCW. And, th and that's why that's happening. Again, I can come on to the things that we're trying to put in place in order to address that when I uh, uh, present the progress report in a moment. So moving on from the summary of compliance, um, allocation of resources, only 29 days of counter fraud that um, 
were provided last year to the organisation based upon the planned 40 days allocation. That was generally due to short staffing within the department. They were down to two at times and, and literally, the, well, simply there just weren't enough days in order to cover all the organisations. So there was no sort of getting around that. Um, there's the summary of costs there um, that I provided. Um, there were no investigations with regards to sort of criminal activity within the organisation last year, which um, can be seen, you can be looked at in two ways if you like. One one is positive that there weren't any, or, or two is negative that none were reported to us. So um, it, it, it's, uh, again, you're not, I wouldn't say DHCW is an outlier in regards to that, that the general investigative work that we we carry it carry out tends to be again from a more of a mainstream sort of health board setting if you like so there's smaller organizations that we provide for um it doesn't tend to have a a, a, a huge amount of investigative work um in, involved however obviously it, if there is investigative work to be carried out we will do it so as a result of that there have been no disciplinary sanctions criminal sanctions civil sanctions or recoveries um Broad awareness sessions were carried out in the year, only two were carried out and they were carried out in relation uh, and delivered to 32 staff members across the organisation. And that's about it really for the for the annual report. And if anybody would like to ask any questions, then I'm more than happy to try and answer them for you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, and um, uh, we're very grateful uh, for, for that update on the annual report. And I commend you also on the clarity of uh, the report and the presentation. Uh, that's really helpful. Uh, I can see that David Selway has a question for you. David? Uh, thanks, Maureen. Uh, thanks, Gareth, for the uh, the update. Uh, could you say just say a little bit more about the changes that have taken place around the onboarding of agency staff uh, and the additional checks we're now making? Um, and whether you have a view of given we probably have a number of agency staff still with us that came on before those checks were being made, whether there's a need to retrospectively apply them. Yeah, well, essentially, David, I, I, I'm not that au fait with the ins and outs of the report. It was prior to my time. However, I have looked at it and the results that I found within that um, report in relation to DHEW in particular were that there were no particular issues within DHEW. I have since that time reported the whole um, the whole effort on the clue database system that we use and there's a review date that I've put on that for December this year so that we will um, moving forward make those sort of spontaneous checks to provide assurance that the agencies that we are using um, are, are carrying out the checks that we require, but also that um, DHCW have in place their own system of checks, which is, which I think was the result of that report, was that DHCW had their own checks in place um, for agency staff coming in, which is, is generally not something that you see in a health board operation where there's so many agency staff coming in, for example, nursing staff, healthcare staff. We, we, we have to rely on the agency to carry out those checks for us and that, that's where the dip sampling comes in and is more appropriate if you like but it is in place for DHCW for that to take place later in the year in order that we can provide assurance that that um, that, that that the systems DHCW have in place is, is robust um, moving forward. I, I hope that answers your question. It, it does, thank you Gareth, yeah. I'm reassured about that, thank you. Thank you David and thank you Gareth. I just wonder whether Claire wanted to come in at all at, uh, at this point, looking back over the year, our first year clearly of operation in the context of, of counter fraud. Yeah, I would say that um, as actually Gareth uh, reported, um, it's been a year where we've worked hand in hand, uh, given the, the issues they've had in terms of your resources. We've worked alongside each other, done our own internal risk assessments in key areas. So we we, we've tried to be proactive and, and also with the support, and, and I think she's on the call here, of, of um, oh gosh, I'm, my name has now for, uh, uh, left me. Um, sorry, I'll find it now. Uh, we have our own internal uh, champion, our, our fraud champion, counter fraud champion, Rachel. 
sorry, Rachel, mind blank. Uh, Rachel Powell is also our, our champion. So we've worked uh, in this area. I think both Gareth and I uh, recognise that there's some opportunities that we can really focus on. And I think uh, key areas in terms of being able to report, but in, in terms of also being raising awareness. Um, so it, it's actually um, poignant that we've had that induction and the importance of induction and the involvement in counter fraud in that will be an area of focus going forward. And you'll see that in, in the annual plan. Um, in, in relation to the agency, David, we do have um, stringent checks before. And I think it was us that identified a potential issue that we raised with counter fraud um, just to be um, more aware where we've got uh, individuals that are working for us, but potentially could be working for someone else. Uh, and we do do um, um, reviews to ensure that the agency staff are delivering on their um, scope of work and requirements on a regular basis, and that's checked through the, the management board KPI then. So it is an area um, that we do focus on, and it's probably one that we can manage because it's less volume compared to health boards and trusts, uh, but it certainly is an area that we would still continue to, to monitor and, and uh, do some random checks to ensure that our processes are robust in that area. So yes. Um, yeah, so thank you, Chair. Dioch, Claire, thank you, Claire. And um, uh, unless there are any other observations, then the committee is being asked to uh, receive this uh, annual report, our first counter fraud annual report for approval which we do and uh, thank you Gareth and uh, that brings us nicely to the uh, local counter fraud annual plan for this current financial year so I'd like uh, to invite Gareth again to uh, present the annual plan for 2023 uh, which sets out the programme of work for this year Gareth. Thank you Chair. Um, okay yeah the annual plan I mean nothing has changed in relation to the days planned for the year coming up so we're still planning the provision of 40 days for DHCW. Um, this has now been broken down or simplified in a way so as I suggested with regards to the report the old four standards have gone and we're now requested to re we're now asked to report proactive work and reactive work to the counter fraud authority within those new standards so um, I've allocated 30 days proactive work, which includes things like um, audit committee, etc. Those types of things, they're, they're quite broad headings and I'm not sure they, they quite fit, but um, so anything that isn't a reactive investigation essentially, and I've allocated 10 days reactive work. Obviously, if we don't carry out that reactive work in those 10 days, then we'll allocate it to proactive work and we'll, we'll, we'll look at sort of carrying out some further risk work if if and when those days are available. Um, as I say, the new standards are in and, and we're required to work to them. I don't propose to go through every sort of um, requirement with you, but sort of focusing against what I said earlier with regards to the um, annual report. I think the key points for me moving forward with regards to DHCW are I would like to have a much closer sort of involvement and engagement with people within so that I fully understand the organization because I'd be quite open and honest that I probably don't know enough about it at this point in time. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, obviously that can change um, time time permitting. And I think we have some um, diarized appointments coming up with with key people within the organization to move forward with that. Um, most of these requirements are, are already in place anyway, things like counter fraud, bribery and corruption strategy. There's a there's a bit of work to do in those areas just to check that the policies and procedures are in date and in place and the organization's happy with them because I'm aware that, for example, with the uh, fraud, bribery and corruption strategy that um, at the moment, the all Wales one is being utilized. That's under review within shared services partnerships. So that's something we can maybe discuss whether we're happy to use that going forward. Risk assessments, as I said, um, it's, it's a relatively um, new activity for us within counter fraud. Historically, we've always been an investigation department, but we are being um, um, pushed in that direction by the counter fraud authority and we do um, aim to always sort of do fraud, pr fraud proofing exercises following investigations, but I think we've been pushed now more to proactive exercises. And again, that's something that I hope to engage with the organization upon and, and maybe um, find some key areas of risk that, that they think pertinent 
for um, for us to look at this coming year. Um, and then obviously that will be reported according to the methodology given by the uh, County Control Authority. Outcome based metrics, that's again a, a, a newish sort of thing. It's, it's, I, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that that's, that's to do with, you know, how do we show what we're doing is actually being effective. So we're putting a few things in place in order that we can measure that. Again, most of this stuff I can address in the counter fraud progress report coming up in a moment to say it's, it's, see where we're going in quarter one. Um, reporting routes for staff and contractors, we're working towards uh, improving those and improving our identity within the organization so that staff members are um, feel comfortable with coming to us and they know the report uh, the routes in order to get to us um, and essentially that that's re really about it I mean it's all written down there what we plan to do the, the plan is written in quite a broad um, and f it's, it's meant to be flexible and dynamic I don't want to narrow us down too much um, because we don't know what's going to come up over the, the, the quarter. So I like to keep it broad. I like to keep it flexible in order that we can react to things that come along, notwithstanding that we will be carrying out sort of um, various bits of proactive work. So I'm sure there'll be some questions and I can see Claire has one. So um, I should be quiet and uh, <laughs> take those. <laughs> Thank you, Gareth. Um, so the committee is being asked to re review and approve the plan. Um, so um, I'll now invite Claire to uh, contribute. Claire? Yeah, I just want to bring to the, the committee's awareness and thank Gareth because in a short space of time, not only has he done the annual report, he's also done an annual plan and he's got a progress report, which is phenomenal piece of work and quite a detailed piece of work in a short space of time. And I think the two go hand in hand. It just goes to show in the one report he showed, you know, less allocation of time, uh, lots of opportunities to improve in terms of uh, access to training and involvement in our induction and the risk assessments and also, you know, uh, sharpening us up in a few key areas. So um, I fully endorse the plan. We've worked together on it and I think we can really um, make some progress in some of those key areas. And we as DHCW need to support that, as Gareth pointed out. He can provide a guiding hand, but actually we need to do the legwork. So together with Rachel and the team, we will we'll set up regular reviews to really try and implement this plan and show progress through the committee. So thanks, Gareth, and, and obviously we'll support this plan going forward. Thank you, Claire. That's uh, really helpful to hear that and uh, look forward to seeing that collaboration develop over the, the months and the year to come. Uh, I can't see any hands up, so um, I'm assuming then from the nods around the virtual table that we are happy to approve the contents of this plan uh, in terms of the uh, proposed counter fraud work for 2022-23. And uh, again, can I echo Claire's comments? Uh, this is uh, your first formal uh, presentation at uh, today's meeting, uh, and uh, we're very grateful to you for the work that you've completed to date on uh, both the annual report and uh, the uh, plan for the year ahead. So, dear Gareth. And finally, um, you're not getting off uh, no. <laughs> yet. We have the uh, local counter fraud update report then, uh, which is for noting. But if you'd just like to uh, uh, make some comments, um, over to you, Gareth, again. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, basically, this is the easy one, really. So, so um, the key points to note from the progress report, this is the, the majority we've we've provided 15 days. I've worked out 15 days thus far to DHCW. That has mainly been given on either myself, as Claire pointed out, right in the reports and finding out this, the, the sort of detail for the reports. But moreover, it's been about developing an infrastructure for this organisation. Um, some of it has been for all the organisations, but some of it has been dedicated to DHCW and has been shared around. So essentially what we've been working towards is putting in place a good grounding um, for all the organisations we provide for. Um, and when I say that, I, with regards to um, creating easy uh, uh, reporting routes, et cetera, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. So just to um, bring you up to date on the staffing, and I think I might have mentioned this at the previous meeting, but we are fully staffed now. So there's myself and three full-time counter fraud specialists 
two of which are fully accredited. One is just waiting for their accreditation. So that hopefully will um, provide us with um, the opportunity to provide all days that we we are required to um, give in the coming year. So in relation to the annual plan and the work we've done so far, far I'll just quickly go through it. So we, we've um, created a dedicated generic email address, um, which is easy to find on the global system, but also is publicized in your, um, I think it's the insider in, in DHCW, isn't it, that, that gets put out every every so often. And then we, we've, we do a bi-monthly newsletter, which is also put in there. Um, and we're developing uh, an intranet site, which is just about ready to go on SharePoint, which will be for accessible, we're hoping, from all organizations we provide for. We're not sort of, we, we don't really have the capability to to create our own counter fraud intranet pages for each organization. It would be a bit too, too sort of, too much of a duplication of sort of um, work, if you like. So that's something we, we're just about ready to go on. With regards to learning, um, historically it's been very difficult for staff to know where to go to learn and even if they do it's very difficult to get through the ASR system to, to, to get on the training so in conjunction with Cardiff and Vale we're putting together a learning platform on the Learning at Wales um, site which will be accessible for all members of staff to get into without assigning we're hoping so to make it as easy as possible and that hopefully will get around the issues um, with not being a mandatory training um, package. We obviously have a lot of work to do with regards to awareness within the organisation. We're trying to get on to corporate induction, but as I'm, I'm aware that that's, um, I don't think that's going to happen within this coming year is my understanding. But we are we are doing some awareness sessions, bespoke awareness sessions. I think we've got three coming up in the, the, the next week or two in relation to things like mandate fraud um, and things like that. Um, what else have we got? So um, with regards to alerts and bulleting during this reporting period, we've put out two fraud alerts um, to, to, to relevant groups, and these are shown in the append appendices that you uh, attach to the report. Uh, one was in relation to a scam in relation to Dell computers, and one was in relation to a mandate fraud. Um, as I as I said, no no awareness sessions yet have been delivered, but arrangements are underway to um, to, to to do those in the next couple of weeks in relation to mandate fraud. With regards to the corporate induction, we're working on trying to get ourselves put in there. Um, with regards to a, a PowerPoint initially, obviously the aim will be to get in there in person um, as and when time will allow us to do that. I think that about covers it, but um, you have the report in front of you. And if there's any any questions, then again, please feel free to ask. Yes, Gareth. Uh, thank you, Gareth, um, for highlighting some of those uh, key actions that are happening uh, uh, and have happened indeed since uh, the beginning of this financial year. So um, that was really helpful. So the committee is being asked to note um, the counter fraud work for the first quarter of this financial year uh, leading up to June the 20th. I can't see any hands up, so I think you've uh, uh, very effectively uh, answered any questions or observations that we have. Uh, so for, for the last time this morning, then Gareth, thank you very much and we wish you well with the work over the year uh, to come. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, we are slightly um, ahead of schedule, but I suggest we do take a, a comfort break now then, but perhaps it is uh, just before five past, suggest we come back at 20 past 10 then. So a 15 minute break just to stretch your legs uh, and we'll come back for uh, part five of uh, the agenda at 20 past 10. See you soon. Welcome back, uh, colleagues, to uh, part five of the Audit and Assurance Committee uh, at Digital Healthcare Wales. Um, we will now move on to parts five and six of the meeting, um, which focuses uh, on governance activity, uh, and uh, all the reports will be presented by uh, DHCW colleagues. So we'll start with agenda item 5.1, 
uh, risk management and board assurance. Uh, and I'd like to invite our board secretary, Chris Darling, to present the update on the corporate risk management and board assurance report. So uh, over to you, to Chris. Uh, Diok Chair, um, I'm going to start off uh, by just uh, talking committee members through where we've got to from a board assurance report perspective, and then I'll move on to our current risk register, corporate risk register position and work through those. So the committee um, received our board assurance report template in January and endorsed it. There's been a fair amount of activity and work that's taken place um, in the six months since that time and uh, item 5.1i is the latest version of the board assurance report dashboard. Um, we took that to board at the end of May um, as a draft and we've had two board development sessions since then, the most recent one last week. So I'll just um, draw out the fact we've um, revised the risk appetite for each of the strategic missions. So for each of the five DHCW strategic missions, we have the principal risks or threats to achieving those missions and uh, the risk appetite associated with that. So we've updated that. That's included within the pack uh, for commi committee members um, to note. Um, and the final part of getting uh, um, our board assurance report is to take that final draft to board in July, after which point we will take um, the board assurance re report to board on a by annual basis um, and the proposal as it goes in May and November. Um, but obviously we've done a lot of work on that. So we've seen it a lot more at this committee and at board uh, as a result of getting some of those foundations in place. So if I just move on to the um, corporate risk register position, there's currently 23, sorry, 22 risks on the risk register, 13 of which are detailed in the papers today. There are nine uh, security related risks that are um, taken at the Digital Governance and Safety Private uh, Committee due to the sensitivity uh, of those risks. Uh, and just in terms of um, those predominantly cyber risks, it should be noted the cyber posture report went to the May um, SHA private board meeting as well for some additional scrutiny at the full board. In terms of changes to the corporate risk register since the last audit committee meeting, there's been six new uh, risks that have gone on to the corporate risk register. Um, five of those are documented uh, within the table in the paper, <clears throat> one of which is a private risk. So I'll just work through quickly those that have been added since the last committee meeting, which are the increased utility costs, financial pressures, the unfunded national insurance increase, the Data Priorities Investment Funding, or DPIF. Um, that, as I understand it, has now been downgraded to the Directorate Risk Register. So um, that's happened relatively quickly since publishing these papers, but Claire and Mark might want to comment on that uh, shortly. Uh, the Data Centre Migration Revenue Funding and the Digital Inflation Corporate Risk. So the committee will note um, all those five risks that have been added on all relate to financial pressures of some description uh, and have been escalated over the last two months uh, with Claire's approval. Um, just to note the risks that we've removed since the last committee meeting, there has been five. Um, those uh, three of which were, have been private risks. Uh, one infrastructure investment has been removed uh, and to some extent probably superseded by some of those other financial uh, risks and the Welsh language two-way texting uh, bilingually has been removed since the last committee meeting as well. Uh, section 3.6 of the report lists out those risks um, that are assigned to this committee so the staff vacancies uh, 0259 being the first one uh, Shikola did a, a deep dive into that risk at our January committee meeting and there is a a recruitment task force lessons learned report that's going to board at the end of July, uh, which should hopefully give us um, some insight and feedback in terms of how we're mitigating that risk. Um, the other one, just to pick out Welsh language compliance, um, we've got uh, an item in, in, in two items time uh, to go through the Welsh language compliance report. And I'll just pause there, uh, Chair, for, for Claire to just comment on the other risks that have been added because those other ones are now sitting under Claire as the exec owner for those. 
Yep. So thank you, uh, Chris. What, what we're reflecting in the risk register is really the underlying inflation that we are seeing, some of which will be covered um, by centrally by Welsh Government. So both the NI and the fuel increase, uh, the energy increase, uh, we submit on a on a monthly basis into Welsh Government as part of our monitoring returns, and they'll cover that risk centrally. Um, the other the other ones then during the month, you're right, the Digital Priorities Investment Fund. Um, the capital element of that fund was reduced by 10 million and equally they were reprofiling the the revenue aspects of that. So during the month, um, DHCW led together with the directors of digital peer group, the reallocation of the revenue funding across the year, which has enabled us to remove that risk now and, and align to our current uh, planning deliverables uh, within that. Um, and the other one that is uh, becoming clearer now with the work that's going on with Gareth and um, the ICT and ADS teams is the data centre migration. So our current contract is up for um, um, is up for renewal, and as a result, we are uh, then evaluating what the potential um, cost implications of that move may or may not be. And uh, although they will fall into the next financial year predominantly rather than this one. We are flagging that risk up now. Um, in the previous data centre move, that was covered by the Digital Priorities Investment Fund. And as you can see, that has been challenging this year. So to avoid any, uh, to ensure that that priority um, is recognised uh, by Welsh Government, um, we are flagging it up now and socialising that risk more broadly, um, which will enable us to be uh, prioritised as part of that allocation for next year. And I think generally what we're seeing um, like other sectors uh, within the economy, is what we're 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 um, creating a narrative around the digital inflation. So, as you're aware, we finalised the Microsoft licence contract recently. What we are seeing is is uh, an increase. Some of that is in relation to hardware, to do with supply chain issues and and lack of supply in, in some key areas. But equally. I would say within the licensing area, we're seeing um, some significant increases in those areas. So um, we're flagging that up um, and um, making people aware that actually, you know, digital inflation is is of the level that you're seeing in other sectors so that people don't, um, in a broader context, don't lose sight of the fact that we are suffering increases in, in, in prices. Um, so those were the, the key areas and obviously um, with the work that we've undertaken last year uh, with the data centre move and some of the infrastructure investments that we've made, uh, we are now, as part of that um, plan going forward, uh, we've taken a, a review of our, our infrastructure investment requirements and, and, and as a result, we've downgraded that risk, um, which I think reflects some of the hard work Karin and the team have done over the last number of years to uh, stabilise um, that platform. That's not to say that there isn't um, investment needed, but I think that is shifting more to the system rather than the, 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 the systems infrastructure, rather than the infrastructure infrastructure going forward. Um, so yes, unfortunately there were quite a number this, this month, but I think it really gives and, and reflects the current um, context that we operate in. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll just um, just pick up a few few more points, Chair, and then I'll open for questions. So, um, item five point um, I I I triple I um, is included the B B board assurance and risk milestone plan. That is now uh, complete in terms of the work that we set out to do when we established as an SHA. What I will bring to the committee at the next meeting in October is um, a work plan for risk and, and board assurance going forward for the next year. So that will supersede that now we've completed the tasks on there. Key areas being um, our, our regular review of our risk appetite position um, and as um, as part of the IMTP process, um, as the strategic uh, objectives or strategic missions um, that Michelle's team will take us through, as they're confirmed, we'll work back and check um, that the risk appetite remains or changes depending on what those strategic missions look like going into next financial year. Um, just a, a comment, the Digital Governance and Safety Committee I mentioned, um, they review the cyber risks um, in private session. They meet next um, in early August um, and they had their last meeting a couple of months ago. So I don't know 
David Selway is the vice chair of that committee. Whether he wants to comment on the assurance um, we're, we're getting and the scrutiny that committee is giving to those cyber risks. Um, and just finally, um, uh, if uh, chair, you or any of the committee members want a deep dive in any of these risk areas for the next committee, we're happy to do that. Perhaps the data center migration um, risk, given the timing, might be a good one, but happy to explore that between now and the next committee meeting. So I'll pause there for any questions and just see if David wants to comment on the digital governance and safety position. Thank you, David, if you will. Uh, I'll uh, come in now then. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary, and thanks, Chris. Yes, um, um, all of the uh, cyber risks have been dealt with in the private session because of their very nature. Uh, we've done, uh, in addition to the normal meetings, we've done a one-off uh, deep dive into the cyber issues and, and I can uh, provide some assurance to this committee that um, we've done a thorough job of understanding the risks and uh, there are action plans in place to mitigate those risks. So on that topic, um, um, I'm, I'm comfortable in terms of my role on as vice chair. Um, I do have a question, Marion, do you want me to take it now or? Why not, yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thanks, Claire, for the update on the DPIF. That's really good news that we've managed to mitigate that. Uh, could you just say a little bit more on, on what the impact is to the programmes? Have we basically just um, reduced the scope on all of the things that we had in flight or has anything dropped out um, of what we were planning to do this year? So when we initially did the risk assessment, there were one or two of our schemes that were um, we're at risk. So um, uh, in particular, cancer was one of the ones that was uh, and, and RW PAS. But I, um, what we've now done is reprofiled other schemes where there is a significant more financial allocation and more ability to absorb changes over the over the programme's life to enable those those two or three particular schemes to to be fully funded. So I think we looked at this as a collective digital uh, a digital portfolio rather than individual schemes with the, di the directors of digital peer group and decided that uh, and, and proposed to ask government an alternative funding uh, allocation which was uh, accepted by the SROs of those particular schemes and has now um, enabled us to get the funding guaranteed for those particular schemes that we were particularly concerned about. So I think it's really a reflection of working in collaboration with the broader um, programmes that DHCW don't necessarily um, lead uh, and trying to enable us to maximise the benefits given the priorities we've got. Um, so I, I think we've had all the funding letters back. I'll just check with Mark if that's the case, but I think um, that was agreed and went to the Minister for approval and, and therefore it has enabled us as DHCW to mitigate the risks that we thought we would have. Um, Mark, did you want to come in on the funding um, confirmation yeah um claire just say we we've had about 90 percent of the funding letters thus far there were one or two which had to go back to the minister in terms of just going through the formalities and the administration before it gets um actually formally sent to us but um uh, you're correct i think the the endeavors of the um the service and the the digital directors as a whole has meant we're, we're able to manage the um the challenges that face the dpif um, central funding program. That that said, though, David, I think this year we can say that we've managed the process. My concern would be the future years and mm. having to reprofile it. What does that mean? And I think there's a bigger mm. piece of work that we now need to do, which is why actually I'm flagging up the potential data centre move and cost implications, uh, because there, you know, it's not standing still. There are new initiatives that we would want funding, and and it's raising awareness of that. Uh, which is which is important. So it it remains a challenge, but for this year we can we can we can confirm that we've had the allocations to enable us to deliver the key priorities for DHEW. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for that confirmation, uh, Mark, uh, and to David for uh, your questions and specifically for the assurance that you've been able to provide to this committee on. Uh, uh, the cyber, cyber risks that are considered by um, the Digital Governance Committee. Uh, that's um, welcome and, and noted. Are there any further questions or observations? 
Um, we've had a challenge from Chris in terms of a potential deep dive, and I think it is timely that we do begin to look in more detail at some of these risks. Um, the data center migration is certainly one area worthy of consideration. Um, perhaps I would invite colleagues to have a ponder and think whether there is any other area that you would particularly welcome a deep dive on uh, at our next meeting, which is being held in October. Uh, so uh, as an action, perhaps you could feedback on that uh, over the next uh, few days, which would be very welcome. Chris, any closing remarks? No, nothing from me, Marin, other than to say, yep, happy to work with colleagues to identify where we would have most value having a deep dive in October based on where we're at at that point. Thank you. So um, we've uh, had the opportunity to review the corporate risks, uh, those assigned to this committee. Um, so we note the status of the corporate risk management and board assurance framework and really welcome the uh, the hard work that's gone into the development of, uh, of, of the framework. And I think we're getting to a very uh, pleasing and positive state, actually, given the, the hard work that's gone on over the last few months. Thank you, then. Let's move to uh, agenda item 5.2, which is the Welsh Health Circular Annual Report. So uh, it's my pleasure now to invite Laura Tolley, uh, the Corporate Governance Manager, to present this annual report. Uh, this is being uh, received to provide assurance on the process that we have for recording and monitoring our compliance with Welsh health circulars. Laura, close up. Diolch, Marion. Um, so this is the first time we've presented a Welsh health circular compliance report to the committee and going forward it's going to uh, plan to be presented on a biannual basis just to provide uh, the committee with assurance on DHCW's compliance with Welsh health circulars. Um, so for a bit of background, Welsh health circulars are issued to all NHS trusts health boards and special health authorities by Welsh Government, which must be implemented and actioned where relevant. A fair proportion of these aren't relevant for DHEW, but we um, all of them that are re received are reviewed just to confirm that. So the uh, corporate governance team maintain a tracker for monitoring and recording uh, Welsh health circulars received. And they're also sent to the weekly executive directors meeting for review and to agree the relevant executive lead for action. Um, any action then is monitored by the corporate governance team and the tracker is updated accordingly. And in addition, a monthly progress update report is shared with uh, the weekly executive directors for assurance as well. Um, in the Appendix A of the report, that details all the Welsh Health Circulars received by DHCW in the period 2021-22. All have been reported to Weekly Executive Directors and DHCW's Management Board. They are all complete, signed off by Executive Leads and there are no outstanding circulars on the register for 2021-22. And so we're just asking the committee today to note the update uh, provided and just to be assured on the process for the recording and monitoring of the organisation's compliance with these circulars and happy to take any questions. Dear Laura, thank you for that. Um, and it's uh, a welcome development, I think, to, to be bringing this uh, particular report on uh, compliance against the uh, Welsh Health Circulars uh, to this committee. Uh, any questions, colleagues? Any observations? I think the report speaks for itself uh, and it's clear from the nods around the virtual table that uh, you provided us with uh, the information that we required and the assurance um, that we required, Laura. So thank you for that and um, we look forward to seeing you present the next uh, um, report in probably six months time then, Laura. So we note the Welsh Health Circular Annual Report. Uh, and let's move on to agenda item 5.3 then. And this is the Welsh Language Compliance and Improvement Framework. Uh, my blessed, Genirwan Grosawi, 
Rheolwr yr Iaith Gymraeg, Larry Jenkins. It's my pleasure now to uh, welcome Larry Jenkins, our Welsh language manager who uh, joined us uh, earlier this year. Uh, and uh, Larry is going to present the Welsh Language Compliance and Improvement Framework Report, uh, which will provide an update on uh, DHCW's current compliance with the Welsh language standards. Uh, and can I just say on a personal note how delighted we are with Larry's appointment. And it'll be uh, well good for, for us all, I think, to hear about the progress that's being made in this area. Felly, Larry, rhoi so mawr. Uh, um, yes, yeah, just uh, it's coming up to six months this this week, actually, since I started and um, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at uh, TCW and what attracted me to this organisation was how organised they are with the Welsh language standards, even though they haven't got a, a compliance notice. The fact that there's a Welsh language group established even before I started is is amazing. And the fact that the Welsh language scheme had already been written before I started. So, you know, you've made a huge amount of progress, um, which is really a good starting point for me um, in, in this role. So I'll, I'll just go through my um, paper and get it up on the screen for me now. Um, so basically, the, the first part is the background, which you all know, but going to 2.4 um, on the paper, it just outlines what I'm going to cover um, with you this morning. Um, so the Welsh Language Act Compliance Action Plan, we've slightly improved that from the last um, audit committee. Um, progress with the Welsh Language Scheme, which is quite exciting. I can't wait to tell you about that. The current Welsh Language Skills Dashboard, so we've got a little bit on that, and the activity that I've been um, undertaking over the last few months. So going to uh, point three there, the Compliance Action Plan. Um, initially, we uh, presented an, um, an action plan which included all 120 um, Welsh language standards, which um, are included on the Health Board's compliance um, uh, reports. So I don't think we needed to go into that much detail as we don't we don't have a compliance notice from the Welsh Language Commissioner. So what we've done is we've grouped them together um, to make it um, easier to manage, easier to monitor compliance. Now I've um, in this little chat in 3.1, um, I must say that I have estimated these are just being plucked out of the air. They're not, um, you know, figures that I've been able to quantify um, this where I believe DHCW are at the moment. Um, so the standards, as you know, are split into four areas. So you've got service delivery, policy making, operational and record keeping standards. And, you know, we're about halfway there with service delivery standards and operational standards, policy making standards. I know it's a 25 percent there, but it only means that you know, if we have a robust equality impact assessment process, then that would shoot up to 100%. So that it doesn't, it won't take too much to get that into the green. Um, record keeping standards, you know, we're, we're flying with those. Uh, once we've got a Welsh language scheme published and approved, then, you know, that will be up at the 100% as well. So, Moving on to 3.2 there with the Welsh language scheme, the progress. We've been back and forth with the Welsh language commissioner now for several months um, and we did get to a point a few weeks ago where they were happy with it. Um, it has gone out to consultation. It went out on the 1st of July. Uh, we've got a web page on the DHCW website um, dedicated to the scheme with a link to it. Um, a link to email for feedback. Um, so that was sent out by email to um, hundreds of stakeholders on Friday. Um, and we held back on the social media until this morning, be mainly because um, learning from HEIW, when they launched their scheme, um, they had quite a lot of negative feedback on social media. Um, so we didn't want to put that out at, on the weekend because it wouldn't be monitored um, 
just to talk, actually have a look at the, the if we did have negative feedback. I, maybe we won't. Hopefully we won't. Um, so we we decided to start the social media today when staff are in work and able to monitor the accounts. Um, so hopefully we will get some feedback over the next 12 weeks. We'll put reminders out to stakeholders every month. Um, and then we compile a report which is then presented to our management and um, to the Welsh Commissioner again before we hopefully will be able to launch around November, December time. Um, so the, the skills dashboard 3.3 on the, the report. Um, the no skills is still quite high, but it has reduced by 1% over the last um, two months. Um, I'm hoping that this is because of the work that I've been doing, but uh, we'll see. Um, so 71% is still quite high uh, for no skills, and we are encouraging staff as much as possible um, through news items on SharePoint. We're putting things um, in the insider. I'm going out to deliver sessions in um, away days, so hopefully staff will start to update their skills. The 94.3% Welsh language awareness um, compliance. I'm not concerned about that at all at the moment because that figure is is really quite high when you compare it to other NHS organisations. Um, and I would want to actually discourage staff from completing the Welsh language awareness at the moment because we uh, Welsh government are launching a new course and it's imminent. We have signed up to be part of the pilot, which we should be starting any day now. Um, and there's a brand new course that will be on ESR and mandatory for all NHS Wales staff. The old one is quite old fashioned. It doesn't include anything about the Welsh language standards. So any staff who haven't done the Welsh language awareness course so far, I would discourage them from doing it until the new one um, arrives. Um, so yes, we, we're doing OK with the, you know, the numbers are going in the right direction, um, but there's still a lot of work to do with ESR. So um, develop, developing the Welsh language skills of staff, 3.4 there. So we've, um, I deliver an induction session, which tends to generate some excitement about learning Welsh and I get to names of staff who are, are keen to learn. Um, We've been doing the team building sessions in away days um, and there's also a new confidence building group for staff at level three and above. And these are meeting every other Wednesday. Um, and what I found is that the majority of the staff that attend those sessions attended Welsh comprehensive schools or secondary schools and haven't used their skills since then. And they understand everything that I say in this in this group, but are unable then to um, speak Welsh back to me. Um, but I'm encouraging, encouraging them to do as much as possible, even if it means putting an English word in a sentence um, and just trying to build their confidence to, to speak Welsh again, because all those skills are in in there somewhere. We've also got a Duolingo Challenge Yama group. And we have um, so many staff using Duolingo, it's surprising um, to learn Welsh. And we have staff who have 300 day streaks, which means that they haven't missed a single day of learning. We have one member of staff with 700 day streak, so it, it's going really well. And it's quite competitive as well. I can see the comments on there uh, on a daily basis. Um, and then we've been doing some collaborative work with NHS Wales partners. So I've set up a group with my colleagues from the health boards um, and we're doing a sort of collaborative work with courses for staff, uh, looking at resources, etc. So there's quite good work going on there. So looking at our risks in particular. Um, my main concern and 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 this isn't unique to DHCW. Um, all of the health boards are having the same issue, and that's advertising jobs bilingually and um, having Welsh versions of job descriptions. And apart from, I think, Betsy, who have been translating them for years and years because they've got a, a, a quite a large translation team there, no other health, health board has managed to do um, 
comply with this standard. With us being, you know, quite small, I can't see any issue with us complying with this. Um, shared services have just started work on, on this and they are hoping to be fully compliant in the next few months. And I think we need to follow that. And, you know, uh, that example, we did have non Richards from shared services into the Welsh uh, language group meeting to share their experience. And I think it's something that we really need to push forward with um, because the job advert in particular is what the public see. And if we want to be a bilingual organisation, then that is, you know, that it's crucial that that is bilingual. Um, and then I've attached the, the Welsh Language Compliance and Improvement Framework, which is uh, Sophie um, helped develop before she left. Um, and it just um, it's just an outline of, of how we're going to monitor compliance going forward. Um, there are three pillars, uh, training and resources, events and support and compliance and reporting. It's quite self-explanatory. Um, going forward then to um, what 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 have I done over the last six months? I think I'd, I think I'd like to focus more on on you know the activities that we've been doing. So I've obviously I've been to several meetings um, over the last few months, and sometimes I don't understand anything, but I I think I'm getting there. Um, I have also started going to the Moodle Service Management Group meetings, which are. Um, meetings of the heads of communications across NHS Wales. And it's important that I'm involved in, in um, meetings like this because I've been able to influence them in relation to standards that are important to them, um, in particular standard 65, which is collecting primary care information. Um, so prim primary care services that are available in Welsh, and this has been an issue that the Commissioner has raised, Welsh Government have raised. Um, and I think we are making some progress um, by me attending that group. We're also looking at um, terminology in letters, so patient letters. Um, it's become apparent that some health boards are using different terminology for, say, um, clinics that they have. Uh, so we're looking at standardising um, the, that terminology going forward, um, and that involves working with all the, the um, translators across NHS Wales. So there's lots of exciting things happening, and I think they're going to make a big difference to patients going forward. Um, my main focus now over the summer in particular will be um, developing a prospectus of training for staff so that they're aware of the, of the opportunities for them right through from entry to um, developing the, the uh, skills that they already have. So that's the focus over the summer and then in September, hopefully loads of staff will be learning Welsh. So are there any questions on the report? Dear Hilary, for that uh, comprehensive update, there's uh, an awful lot of work going on clearly and uh, you've helpfully highlighted uh, where your priorities are going to be, where the focus will be over the, the coming months. Um, uh, can I just ask, before I open it out to, to colleagues, where do you think the key challenges are for us as an organisation going forward? You've highlighted a number of issues, but what do you think in terms of uh, taking this agenda forward, uh, where are the main challenges? I think the recruiting um, Welsh speaking staff, that's your main, the main challenge. And unless we're advertising bilingually and having bilingual job descriptions, we are not going to attract Welsh speakers to the organisation. Um, we also need to do some outreach work with Welsh schools, etc. Welsh speakers in colleges, universities, and, and just, you know, get that message out there that we are a bilingual organisation and we want Welsh speaking speakers to come to us. For example, um, as a Welsh speaker myself and not doing a clinical role, I wouldn't have even thought about looking at NHS jobs for a job uh, until somebody told me about 
these kinds of jobs. And, you know, it, it's not something that a Welsh speaker, non-clinical, for example, would look on NHS jobs. So that's, that needs to be addressed. And we need to be advertising maybe outside of NHS jobs um, because there are recruitment agencies out there that are specific for Welsh speakers. So I think that's the biggest challenge um, and a challenge because of the translation involved as well. Now, we do have, a, um, you know, an SLA with um, shared services, but obviously that's only to a certain point um, and we did overspend on that last year. Now, if we start sending all of our job descriptions, then the likelihood is that we will overspend again this year. So that's, you know, a little bit of an issue um, as well. But we need to make a start at the moment. That's all I want to do is to see all the new jobs being advertised bilingually. And then eventually we will, you know, translate all of them. It may take two years, it may take three years, but at least we make a start on this work. Given that many of the job adverts and job descriptions are, are generic and there are variations on the theme of large uh, parts of, of job descriptions, uh, we should be able quite quickly to develop a corpus of terminology that should make this work far easier going forward. Um, yeah. So one would hope that uh, uh, as time goes by, that whole process of uh, translating will be much easier and uh, you know, facilitated by by the corpus of terminology that we will have uh, developed over the coming months. Yes. Yeah. OK, can I uh, ask whether there are any questions specifically to uh, Eleri? I got another question then. I can't, can't see any of the hands up. It's about the ESR and inputting staff details on the ESR. You've highlighted um, some problems with that. Um, and I, I picked up somewhere that there is an update in uh, uh, planned to facilitate and to make that process far easier. When can we expect that to, to be implemented, Aleli? Do we have a sense of a timeline? Um, it's with workforce at the moment. I think they're working through um, that 71% that we had at level zero is working through to see um, if they are actually level zero because they've been defaulted to level zero and need to be changed. Now, I found several staff along the way who are actually level twos and threes and shown them how to update. Um, but it's actually working through that list of all the level zeros um, and and updating them. Um, so that's with workforce at the moment. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to get that done in the next two to three months. Dear um, well, we wish you well with this uh, important uh, agenda and, and really good to see the progress that's been made uh, to, to date. So we've been asked to uh, uh, receive and endorse the Welsh Language Compliance and Improvement Framework. Um, and um, uh, I can see from the nods around the table that colleagues are happy to do that. Um, and we look forward to seeing a, a real step change it's in what's being delivered uh, uh, in terms of the Welsh language going forward. And um, we look forward to you joining and getting further updates on progress uh, over the coming months. Yeah. Well, Dear and so we'll move then to agenda item 5.4. Uh, and this is the Standards of Behaviour report. And I'll ask uh, Laura now to uh, introduce uh, the Standards of Behaviour report. Laura. Yeah, Marian. Um, so the Standards of Behaviour report comes routinely to uh, Audit and Assurance Committee, and it covers declarations of interest, gifts, hospitality, honorary and sponsorship activities for DHGW. Um, and just to recap, today we're presenting the new register for 2022-23. At the last committee meeting in May, we reported in terms of declarations of interest, DHEW achieved a compliance rate of 87% for all staff banded 18 and above. And we are aiming uh, to exceed that figure for this year. 
Uh, to date for 2022-23, we have refreshed all board members' declarations of interest and we're at 100% compliance with these. And at the time of writing the report, we're at 34% of declarations of interest being received for staff banded 8A and above. Uh, work is ongoing to capture these and we expect to see the number of declarations captured increase significantly at the October committee meeting. And it's just to say as well, in line with other NHS trusts, health boards and special health authorities, DHEW have agreed that from April 22 onwards to operate a three year declaration of interest form. But to note, all board members will be required to complete an annual declaration of interest form. And it is also our intention to enable all staff to complete a declaration of interest form via ESR. And this is a national approach and we're expecting an update on progress later on in this month. And so we'll keep the committee updated on this as it progresses at the next meeting. And um, for today, the committee are asked to note that nine declarations of hospitality were received since the last meeting, all of which are detailed within Appendix B of the report and were approved by the relevant executive lead. And in addition, we're reporting in arrears the acceptance of hospitality in February 22 that was raised at the committee meeting in May. And it's just to say we are actively promoting the standards of behaviour policy, declarations of interest, gifts and hospitality across the organisation. So the corporate governance team deliver a presentation at the monthly corporate induction and in addition, a number of targeted communications and general promotion work is planned throughout the year. And we'll just uh, give you updates on those as we go through the year. Um, so we're just asking the committee to note the standards of behaviour report today and happy to take any questions. Dear Flora, thank you for that update. Um, very clear in your presentation. Um, and I can see that uh, Ruth has a question. Uh, dear Flora, uh, thank you for thank you for that update. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've made comments about the uh, standards of behaviour piece before that it only works if it's easy for staff to use and that people understand it. Um, so I'm interested in comments about people being able to submit a declaration through ESR. Um, given the issues we know we have with ESR, I don't want to lose any progress we've made in making things accessible for people to be able to complete by something going into ESR and it not working sufficiently. So I just wondered what we are doing to try to make sure that everything continues to progress smoothly for us so that our staff can uh, best understand and best complete the declarations appropriately. I'm happy to answer that one, Marion, if that's OK. Yes, yes. Do, do come in. Fab. So with that one, uh, Ruth, we're working with Workforce to look at what it looks like on the outside. I think it's our form that we do currently makes it quite easy for, for people to complete. So we're just doing some comparative work. I know the Board Secretaries Network are also looking at it to make sure that it is simple for everybody to use. And we're just looking at what how the report looks as well because obviously we've got quite a good way of reporting at the moment so before we roll it out we are looking at it i think as a, as a group to make sure that it is easy to use for staff i think is one of the biggest things people say about standards behavior is making it simple so really keen to keep that and and i'd make a plea that the board members one is simple too because if you want to uh, make sure it's sufficient for the lowest common denominator, then make sure we can fill it out easily. Well, <laughs> do. I think that uh, plea is uh, very clearly noted there. Thank you, uh, Ruth. Um, and really good to hear about the work that's going on to raise the awareness of the uh, standards of behaviour policy, because that is absolutely key going forward. Uh, um, uh, so we've been asked to note the uh, work to populate uh, declarations of interest register and to note the declarations of gifts, hospitality, sponsorship and honorary declarations up to uh, the 24th of June. Thank you very much, Laura, for your uh, presentation this morning. Um, and um, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing this work progress over the coming months. Yeah.
So we'll move on then to uh, the uh, high value purchase order and cumulative uh, report. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to invite Mark Cox, the Associate Director of Finance, uh, to present this report. Mark. Thank you, Chair and Board of Paub. Um, as is um, as is um, normal, I just want to present um, the high value items which we've committed to via order for the period to the financial year to date. Uh, in terms of individual orders, uh, you'll see from the report that there are three items. Uh, the first being the All Wales Microsoft Agreement, which came to the May Board. Uh, the second, um, relating to the COVID-19 response, and the Solgari telephony system and um, its individual licenses, which came to the March board. And the third, reflecting the data quality system uh, in terms of the primary care support and GP systems. This particular contract is a legacy arrangement, um, which was originally um, processed and uh, procured via Vlindra and reflects an extension, which has gone through the standard process of being uh, agreed at management board and uh, finally by the chief executive. So I'll just pause there in terms of the individual um, orders over 750,000 to see if there's any questions. I can't see any, Mark, so i um, happy for you to proceed then on that basis. Sure. I'd just like to pick up on a possible improvement um, for consideration by the um, by the committee. Um, to look back and produce a comparator from the last financial year to this year to see if there's any increases, decreases or changes in trend which may be of interest to the order committee. We've um, it, we've looked at uh, the timing of the, the orders thus far and uh, what, we, what we can see is there's discrepancy between the reports between uh, the first audit committee last financial year at 8.3 million for the financial year and obviously the, the larger value up to this financial year of over 25 million. And we think this is obviously down to timing of the committee and the change in times of the committee. So what we're proposing to do is to do comparative reports with uh, consistent timelines going forward. And we think that will be of value to the audit committee in terms of their assurance and, uh, and um, challenge role. The second appendix reflects the cumulative orders by suppliers to date and uh, which um, exceed the 750k value. Uh, you can see there's two uh, suppliers which have um, broken this threshold. The first is BT and this is for uh, orders for the full financial year. The 11 orders uh, included within that particular item and uh, the, the last um, supplier is for the computer centre and there are six separate orders um, accumulatively breaching the 750k. Um, what I would um, like to comment on is the work that's currently underway in terms of assessing the trend and uh, any particular gains that can be made in terms of procurement activity. Uh, what we've seen in our investigations is that they're all generally called off a, a framework um, so there's already the procurement that's taking place uh, where I would say there's opportunities in the agency staff and the agency side of things. And to that end, there's a, a current resourcing strategy which has been um, a, a approved by the management board and there's a, a separate group which will be looking at that. Thank you. That... OK, Thank, thank you, you Chair. You are done. I was just checking. Thank you very much, Mark, for that. Uh, any questions? Any queries on uh, Mark's report on the uh, high value uh, and curative high value orders to date? No, I think you've outlined the position very clearly. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so we note the contents of uh, the report uh, and the uh, high value orders raised to date. Dear Mark. We move on then to, um, well, it's a regular substantive item on this agenda, which is the losses and special payments update, agenda item 5.6. Just checking, um, I'm going to invite Claire now uh, to provide a verbal update on the losses and special payments, if indeed there, there is any. I'm delighted to say that this month we don't have any uh, special losses and payments and um, so we can move on to the next item, Chair. Thank you, Claire. So we uh, note uh, that fact and uh, 
which takes us on quite nicely to agenda item 5.7, the standing financial instructions compliance review, which uh, is brought to this committee for noting. Uh, so I'll uh, invite Mark now to uh, present the outcome of the annual SFI content and implementation compliance review. Um, there have been a number of changes uh, which uh, are reflected in the uh, tracked document. Um, and uh, they uh, require endorsement to the board uh, for their approval. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, this particular exercise um, can be split into two parts, really. Uh, the review of the content and the, um, the, the policies and processes implemented to ensure um, there was compliance against those um, standard financial instructions. Uh, for context, the standard financial instructions set out the financial responsibilities, the policies and the procedures to be adopted by DHEW in order to comply to relative, leg relative legislature um, and also to ensure the effectiveness, efficiency and sustainability of the organisation. Uh, in terms of the process, uh, it was a, a very granular page turn exercise, as you can see from Appendix A and Appendix B. Uh, where we looked at all the individual reference items within the um, SFIs to ensure that, firstly, um, they still remain consistent with um, uh, with the organisation and um, there weren't any changes, and secondly, to make sure that we've implemented uh, the particular policies, procedures, and and structures in place to order in order to support and ensure compliance. So firstly, in terms of the review of the content of the standard financial instructions, um, we've proposed eight changes, mostly cosmetic and, um, and just grammatical uh, to, to be fair, um, but I'll go through those in, in, in detail. Um, the first is around uh, section four, uh, page 19 of the SFIs and, uh, and item 4.1. Um, where it identifies the revenue and capital allocations are determined by the Welsh Minister. Uh, we believe this is superfluous and in terms of the, the sort of not normal operating activity of DHEW um, is a bit prescriptive. So we've um, we proposed to remove that because fundamentally our funding streams are slightly different from health boards and, um, and some of the trusts. The second item relates to non-pay expenditure in section 11. And this is uh, just to identify that um, the responsibilities in terms of ensuring that the board advised uh, uh, regarding the NHS Wales national procurement and payment systems threshold. So we've, ident we've identified the need to um, reflect the um, structure of DHEW in terms of responsibilities. And we've noted that the director of finance will ensure that the board are advised and not actually advise the board, because fundamentally um, the advice comes from the Director of Strategy Directorate and the Head of Commercial Services. So that was just a, an item for clarification. The third proposed change is just uh, a grammatical change in section 11, page 36. So uh, we've replaced behalf of the DHEW to behalf of DHEW. Uh, the same for page 37, section 11, section 11.6.2. We revise the wording from on the DHEW to on DHEW. Uh, in terms of the procurement and contracting for goods and services, section 12, page 38, we revise the schedule reference from two to one. And the same in the agreements and contracts for all Wales Digital Solutions and Services, section 13. On page 53, we've amended the revised schedule reference again from two to one. In terms of the capital plan and the capital investment section, on page 16, uh, page 68, section 16.7.3, uh, we've amended due to the uh, the makeup of the directors in DHEW, so we moved the reference to director of planning. So that remains as being the executive director of finance. And finally, uh, probably the key change in terms of the standard financial instructions is the revised general consent to enter individual contracts. This basically sets out the processes in terms of contracts over half a million pounds and the reporting and the, the approval that's required from Welsh Government. Um, and that's on page 77, schedule one. 
and the um, the letter has been updated to reflect uh, Digital Healthcare in Wales as a as an organisation. Previously, in the November twentieth, uh, twenty twenty version, uh, DHEW was not identified. So I'll pause there, um, Chair. There's quite a bit in that, and uh... thank you, Mark, for the uh, clarity of that detailed presentation. Uh, can I just check whether there are any questions? Uh, Ruth. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. It was, the presentation was really clear. It's really helpful uh, from my perspective for us to understand um, where changes are, have been made or where we can propose changes to bring it more in line to how we operate as an organisation. And I think that's really key. So it's really helpful to it's really helpful for you to call that out. So uh, a comment rather than a question, Chair, but uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Mark for that. Thank you, Ruth, um, uh, and I'm sure you're echoing all our thoughts around the table. Um, I can't see any other hands up. Mark, anything you, you want to? Uh, yes, I, I, I just like to pick up on the, the, the client uh, compliance exercise, which again was a, a very detailed page to an exercise. Um, in terms of assessment, we obviously um, have not picked up any areas of non-compliance and uh, uh, in terms of um, reporting that to the order committee, obviously go through our board secretary and our director of finance and, uh, and onward to um, to the order committee and we haven't picked up any um, areas of non-compliance. Um, what the report does set out is the um, the policies and the, the structures that have been put in place in order to support uh, the, the achievement of compliance with our standard financial instructions, the challenge and the oversight um, that has been implemented within the first year of the organisation. Uh, I think it's um, uh, a testament to some of the successes we've achieved uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the results of the end of financial year and the um, recent core financial systems audit, which provided reasonable assurance and um, substantial assurance regarding financial controls that um, um, we can take assurance that um, we are in compliance with SFIs. Thank you, Mark. Um, and it's pleasing to note that there were no non-compliances uh, to be reported. Um, so uh, a pleasing uh, position all, all round, I think. Uh, I can't see any hands up, so um, uh, the committee is being asked to endorse the standing financial instructions and the proposed changes you've outlined uh, and to note the progress uh, to date in the implementation and compliance, uh, which, which we do. So thank you again, Mark, for the clarity of your presentation uh, and for helping us understand where we've got to. Um, so in that case, um, Next on the agenda is uh, the update on procurement activity. So uh, I will now hand over to Michelle Sell, uh, our Director of Planning, who will provide an update in relation to the procurement activity in the two month period uh, leading up to the end of May this year. So uh, Michelle. Thank you, Chair. So just uh, briefly, we're reporting two single tenders during this period, so both of which were for services only available through a single supplier, so uh, bespoke services, um, and two contract extensions outside of their original term. Uh, so the first is a, an extension to term only, um, no uh, increase in value over that was originally anticipated, and the other is a small uh, increase to professional services uh, that were used in support of the implementation of the API management platform. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Michelle. I can't see any hands up, so I think uh, colleagues are happy with the information that has been provided. So we note the content of the uh, Procurement and Scheme of Delegation Compliance Report uh, and we'll move on unless there are any other comments. We'll move on to the uh, Quality and Regulatory Compliance Update Report uh, and I will invite uh, Paul Evans, uh, the Executive, uh, uh, the Interim Head of Quality and Regulatory uh, to uh, uh, present an update report um, with one external international organisation for standardisation quality audit this period, 
But first, I'm going to turn to our uh, executive lead for quality compliance uh, to introduce this item, uh, Claire. Thank you, Marion. And this, the, the following two items are, are really, um, we're going to swap them around if that's all right, Chair, and really f start with the annual review of the quality and regulatory uh, performance for 2021-22. Uh, and I'd like just to reflect on um, the progress and the vision that Conrad Kunwigsti brought the team uh, and led uh, uh, predominantly through last year. Unfortunately, He's no longer with us, but I am sure he'd be extremely proud if he was here on the progress that his vision and his plan achieved during 2021. So um, we thought it would be poignant to share the progress uh, and reflect on the achievement that that team has made over the last 12 months. And Paul will touch on first the, the annual review, which will talk through um, the achievements and some of the key deliverables that that team has made and actually some of the outcomes that that had achieved through the performance metrics. So I'm going to hand over to Paul who will uh, talk you through the highlights of last year's annual plan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to touch on what, uh, what Claire has said but, uh, by way of introduction, I, I also want to pay tribute to Conrad uh, for the way that he developed, inspired and led the team during the last year. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge loss to the team. Uh, but <clears throat> excuse me, the team uh, was formed within the Finance and Business Assurance Directorate uh, on the 24th of May last year. Uh, and you'll note that the departmental structure and governance arrangements are, are shown within the report. Uh, there are sections in the report covering each area of the team's responsibilities, but I'd just like to highlight a few, if I may. Uh, the first one being the quality portal. Uh, this was created uh, essentially to increase visibility and provide information on quality uh, and to aid with integration of quality across the organisation. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that the portal, uh, while it's been under continual development uh, in its first year, received over 73,000 visits uh, from uh, members of staff across the organisation. Uh, the next area I'd like to touch on uh, is around the integrated management system or the IMS uh, and the quality improvement action list uh, or QIAL uh, as it's known. Uh, firstly, the IMS, uh, during migration to the SharePoint, SharePoint online platform, uh, the team took an opportunity to review the status of the IMS uh, and found that 14% of documents were overdue for review uh, and 8% of those at least two months overdue. Uh, over the year, this has been reduced to 6% overdue uh, with none over two months. Uh, and that's despite an increase of 27% in the number of documents stored within the IMS. There's a KPI in place uh, of 5% uh, documents overdue. Uh, so we're, we're almost there with that one. And once we achieve that, uh, we will look to improve that, that KPI further. Similarly with the QIALS, there was a deep dive conducted uh, and found that out of 220 open actions on the QIAL, 45% of them had passed their target dates. Uh, some of those actions going back as far as 2014. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the team started producing weekly reports for directors uh, and an initial KPI of 10% of actions outside of target dates was set. Uh, at the end of uh, March 22, uh, the number of past due actions was down to 17.5% from that initial 45%. Um, the current position uh, at the end of May uh, was that this was down to 9% overdue. Uh, so we met the initial 10% target and have now increased that to 5%. Uh, it's also noted there's a 63% decrease in the number of actions being logged onto the QIAL, uh, which I believe is a quality indicator of improved internal audit performance. To audit, uh, the team have developed a new risk-based ISO internal audit programme for, uh, for this year. Uh, this will replace the standard-based system previously in place. Uh, it's designed to be an agile programme, uh, able to work across and flex in line with any identified risks. Uh, Section 2.6.2 of the report that shows our external audit programme results uh, and it demonstrates an overall upward trend in compliance with the international British standards, particularly in line with ISO 27001. The team are also working on implementing a new electronic electronic quality management system uh, called iPassport. Um, initially, we were looking to implement the document control module and that implementation plan has been approved uh, and onboarding is underway across the HCW. So I wanted to mention the 
the medicine healthcare products regulatory authority are in the process of in the UK's medical device regulations. Uh, we expect these to be far more stringent uh, in relation to the requirements around software as a medical device. And the quality team have developed a project plan to ensure that the organisation are in a position to meet the expected regulatory requirements by July next year. Uh, and currently that plan is, is reporting 34% complete, which is in line with expectations. Just a few other notable achievements. Uh, for the first time in 21-22, uh, the quality department had an annual plan. Uh, and indeed, this committee has already approved the current plan for 22-23. Uh, I wanted to mention that the team uh, were lucky enough to be shortlisted in the DHCW uh, staff awards. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't win this year, but there's, there's always next year. Uh, and we've also developed a monthly metrics report, which is reviewed each month by the quality and regulatory group. Uh, and just finally, a, a few sort of next steps for quality, if you like. Um, so we're looking to revise the contents of the corporate induction uh, programme around quality uh, and also developing a more thorough quality team induction plan. Uh, I'm, I'm working with other heads of the department to make sure we've got adequate resource in place to, uh, to, to strengthen the new risk-based internal audit programme. Uh, and flowing from that, um, introducing formal continuous quality improvement plans uh, using some recognised tools such as Pareto, Demaic and PDCA uh, and providing the team with training around those to, to properly integrate them. Uh, and finally, driving forward the onboarding to iPassport and developing plans for uh, further modules around internal audit and non-compliance management. And I, I just want to finish off really by, by formally thanking the team for all their efforts over the last year, particularly over a, a difficult last couple of months for the whole team, really. Uh, and I look forward to leading the team to achieving this year's quality objectives. Happy to take any questions at this point, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for that um, uh, detailed presentation and uh, highlighting uh, very clearly the milestones that have been uh, uh, delivered over the past year. And uh, on behalf of the committee, I think I'd like to endorse your comments and to thank the whole team in what has been a, a difficult period. Uh, and also to endorse the comments that you made, both you and Claire at the outset, in terms of uh, uh, appreciating uh, and conveying our thanks to Conrad uh, for all the work that underpinned uh, this report that uh, we've received today. Can I just check whether there are any questions on any aspect of uh, the uh, uh, report that you've heard to date? Ruth. Uh, thanks, Marion. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Claire. I think I'd echo Marion's comments about the work of the the work of the team, um, and the you know it, it, it's clear the vision that Conrad had set out uh, for us to embed quality across the organisation and not have quality as a you know a standalone separate separate piece um so it, it you know really pleased to see the work that you and the team have been carrying forwards paul to make sure that to make sure that happens um and it, you know i think the the key thing for me going forwards now is that we continue to do that and that actually that language of quality is embedded in everything that we do and we see some of that across the imtp but i think there's more to there's more to do to make make quality something that is part of everybody's everyday role not just a oh now I've got to go and fill fill this out um so yeah obviously keen to hear as and when you start to do more around and start to do more assessment around the uh, training piece and the induction piece for staff to make it make it front and center of people's daily roles so uh, just want to say thank you for that Paul thank you Ruth thank you Ruth and I think it's a really positive development that we are looking to introduce quality now as part of all our corporate uh, induction uh, programmes. So uh, welcome that development as well. So unless there are any other observations, we note the uh, content of uh, the uh, quality and regulatory annual review. So we'll go back then to uh, uh, the uh, quality and regulatory compliance update report, uh, which is also here for noting. Uh, Paul, any additional comments you'd like to make in presenting this item? Yeah, just a few key points I wanted to pull out if I may. So there, uh, there has been one external audit uh, in the last quarter. This was a successful ISO 27001 recertification. Uh, we, we came away with one minor non-conformance and one opportunity of improvement, so that the, uh, a great result for the team. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the onboarding plan for iPassport has been approved by Claire, uh, and to that end, all staff have been assigned user accounts uh, through Active Directory. Uh, the quality portal uh, has received 22,080 visits in the last quarter, so uh, uh, visits to the portal is actually up uh, so far uh, from last year. Uh, it is under continual development, and the latest addition to the to the, the portal is a set of FAQs around iPassport to aid with the onboarding there. Uh, the project for medical device regulation compliance is, is progressing nicely, and the team are currently uh, in the process of assessing our existing service portfolio against MHRA guidance on software as a medical device. Uh, to touch briefly on the Cyber Resilience Unit, uh, they have a couple of key positions um, that recruitment is underway for, but they have successfully completed the first set of audits and reports for Welsh Government. Uh, these have been shared with the health boards and trusts and they're actively collecting feedback on, on the process uh, with plans to share that with the directors of Digital Peer Group. Uh, any ISO audits currently planned uh, for quarter two of this year, uh, but work is uh, just, just now uh, starting to get underway uh, on the contract renewal for the external um, ISO audit uh, contract because that expires in October of this year. Uh, we've provided training for a second raft of internal auditors to underpin the new risk-based ISO internal audit program and I'm really pleased to to, um, to note that the QIAL has imp improved further since the annual report so we we, we, we will we have met that 90% target and improved it to 95. Uh, the annual report um, noted 91% compliance. Uh, we're currently at 93%, so a further 2% in the last month. Uh, so that, that, that that's that's coming on nicely for the team. Um, and yeah, that, that that's about it for the quarterly report. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Paul. There's off. obviously an awful lot going on. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a very busy time. Uh, so we thank you for uh, drawing our attention to some of those key activities. Uh, and um, if there aren't any further questions, I think you've highlighted very clearly all we need to know to give us assurance that that work is in train. So uh, thank you again for the clarity of your presentation, uh, Paul. Uh, and uh, we note the content of your update report and, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Chair. We'll turn now then to uh, agenda item 5.11, which is the baseline governance review action plan report. And I will now turn to Chris Darling, our board secretary, uh, to present the action plan and to update us on where we are. Chris. Yeah, Marion, as um, Nathan mentioned earlier, the baseline governance review was reported to this committee earlier this year in January. Um, the the work it wasn't a formal structured assessment although it covered a lot of the areas a structured assessment would cover um so that work that started on the structured assessment will build on the baseline governance review that was undertaken last year and i think positive for us that david murphy um is working on that structured assessment given the continuity from the baseline governance review that he undertook last year so so that's useful um, the baseline governance review um, work aimed to answer the question, is DHCW making good progress and putting arrangements in place to support good governance and the efficient, effective and economical use of resources? And as committee members will know, the overall finding was that um, we are making positive progress in putting arrangements in place to support good governance and the efficient, effective and econ economic use of resources under challenging operating circumstances. We agreed um, after uh, that initial report that we would continue to monitor the action plan, um, but we noted that the recommendations weren't formal recommendations, they were opportunities for improvement. So we haven't captured them in Julie's formal audit action log. Um, so I'm just gonna pick out some of the areas that we have progressed to date, and there are a number that um, committee members will see that are in amber. Um, so the areas that we've um, completed, um, Oh, the IM recruitment in terms of skills gaps. Um, now, obviously, this recommendation was made um, when we had a gap after Sean leaving the board. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Marion, the situation has changed slightly uh, in terms of IM vacancies. But I'm pleased to say um, the chair, uh, along with um, the, the um, IM panel, 
um, interviewed on the 7th of June and advice has gone to the minister um, to replace um, uh, Sean Doyle um, with a focus on skills gaps uh, and addressing gaps in diversity. Um, the situation now um, is that there is the opportunity um, through those interviews to potentially appoint um, uh, Sean, sorry, Grace Quantock's replacement independent member. Um, so the chair is working that through at the moment with the public bodies unit. In terms of virtual etiquette training, that has been put on for officer members um, since the last uh, meeting and uh, also since then all public committee meetings um, are now uh, recorded and posted um, to enhance our openness and transparency as was the recommendation from um, the baseline governance review and our long-term strategy focus has been built into the board development program for 22-23. Um, as I say, other areas uh, updates are included within the paper. One thing I am keen to do before the committee meeting in October is try and get a position that either closes uh, or is clear the way forward on some of those opportunities for improvement so that we have quite a clean switch from the baseline governance review to the reporting on structured assessment. And I will work closely with Nathan to ensure that anything that isn't um, taken forward from the baseline governance review, we incorporate or try and incorporate as best we can into the structured assessment so we have a neat way of tracking um, both bits of work moving forward. But I am hopeful the majority of the actions or opportunities for improvement we will have taken forward or have a clear position uh, by the next committee meeting. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, Chris, and as you say, um... The, uh, they were opportunities for improvement as opposed to formal recommendations. But I think it's still very positive that we bring this report to this committee um, so we get a, a clear sense of uh, uh, improvement uh, against uh, those proposed actions. And as you say, it will provide a very welcome baseline for the structured assessment uh, when that comes through. Uh, uh, to, to us in November. Uh, questions, comments on any aspect of the report? It's very clear, Chris, and uh, good to see uh, some of those shifting. Um, a number of amber uh, colours there uh, on uh, a, a number of those uh, areas, but um, you clearly uh, highlighted what well, the sort of work that's happening to take us through and, and hopefully move those over to green by the time we next meet. So uh, with that uh, uh, preamble, I will uh, uh, take us uh, to noting then the content of the report for assurance and to thank Chris for the work he's done in terms of uh, producing this report and giving us clarity on those areas of improvement. Um, uh, thank you. We'll move on then to Agenda 5.12, uh, the Estates and Compliance Report. Uh, so it's my pleasure now to invite Julie Ash to present this uh, report uh, to committee. Julie. Thank you, Chair. Um, OK, so this report includes information relating to the estate. Uh, so that includes progress on decarbonisation, uh, our ISO 14001 certification, which is the environmental management system, our estates compliance statistics and health and safety stats. So um, attached to the cover sheet are, are the details. So we've got the estates and compliance monthly report for May, and we've also got our emissions return, um, which we're required to submit to Welsh Government on an annual basis. Recently, um, this, is, this has been since I actually produced this report, we've been provided with a template for a six monthly qualitative uh, report that we'll also need to submit to Welsh Government. So that's all to come in the future. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we are part of the Welsh Government community of experts on climate change. So we attend regular monthly meetings um, on that. And we have agreed to present an overview of our plan uh, to a future meeting. So I'll be um, developing a presentation uh, to provide that. 
Uh, I just wanted to mention some groups we've got in place um, within DHCW uh, covering these areas. So we have our decarbonisation working group. We have an environmental awareness group, which is very much um, a group of volunteers, people who are interested in contributing. We have our safety, health and environmental group, uh, which meets regularly. And we have a water safety group. So all of those contribute to this agenda. So we have made uh, some significant progress in decarbonising our, our state, and I'll share some figures with you in a minute. Uh, but we do recognise this is a very much an ongoing programme of work, and you know we 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 need to keep identifying uh, continual improvements. Just to mention as well, as well as the um, sort of focus on our estates and building. Uh, there's also the contribution our products and services can make, um, as in um, sort of allowing for virtual consultations, that sort of thing, all of which reduces travel. And that's been um, recognised by Welsh Government as well. Uh, and we've been invited to join um, it's the Health and Social Services Group Climate Change Approach to Healthcare Project Board. Quite a long uh, winded title. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're actively involved in that as well. And we've re recently presented to them, um, given an overview of our products. Um, and also another group we've been invited on to, although we haven't attended yet because they haven't met us yet, is the Procurement and Transport Workstream that's run by Welsh Government. Um, so we're hoping there to get involved in um, sort of work to understand the carbon footprint of pr procurements and, and how we can um, contribute to that. So just to move on to share some figures with you. So we undertook a baseline review in 2019-2020. Um, we've recently measured our progress in 2021-22 and I'm pleased to report we've actually achieved nearly 30% reduction so um, that that hopefully you can see the paper there so you, um, you can see it's 29% um, there's been an increase in two areas um, just slight one in fleet um, and the other in home working which is reflective of our new ways of working um, the fleet bit is uh, as a result of us needing to um, use our business vehicle for deliveries to home to facilitate staff working from home. And clearly home working reflects um, just energy used from the home as opposed to the buildings. Um, just wanted to share, and in fact that's now underway, so this paper's slightly out of date, uh, that shared services are are actually auditing us on our decarbonisation management arrangements. So obviously that's welcomed and any suggestions will be gratefully received. Just moving on to environmental management. So just to say we've retained our ISO 14001 um, certification. Uh, training is currently um, at 87 percent, so we are looking to improve that. We would like to see that at over 90 percent. Uh, on to estates compliance, we're ahead of target there. We're currently running at 96 percent against our target of 90 percent. So that's quite positive. Uh, Welsh Government alerts, uh, we much, much as reported earlier um, on Welsh Health Circulars, we, we retain a similar system for Welsh Government alerts. Uh, we've only received one to date this year, which, which has been reviewed and acted upon appropriately. And uh, just in summary, um, just to say that we submitted our plan um, with our IMTP on the 31st of March. Uh, the plans are currently being reviewed and I'm actually due to attend a feedback session on the 12th of July um, for that. Uh, just mentioned the emissions performance again, which is attached to the Appendix B. Um, again, that's showing an improvement on our initial submitted figures, so that's all positive. And um, again, the final one was just uh, about the audit that's currently ongoing. So that was it from me. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much, Julie. Um, some uh, really good stuff there, isn't there, in terms of progress uh, being reported. So thank you for the clarity of that presentation. Uh, I've got questions now. We'll start with David. <clears throat> Thanks, Marianne, and thanks, Julie, for the update. Um, just with regard to our plan for decarbonisation, um, um, my expectation is that at some point we'll require some additional funding from Welsh Government for some of the bigger substantive items that we need to do. Um, in terms of the way we've set out our plan, at what point do we need that additional funding and to, to what extent can we continue to decarbonise based on uh, our plan as it stands at the moment? Yeah, your your point about continue is a good one, David. Um, yeah, the, there there are things we can do, uh, such as um, replace replacing lighting, uh, and there are some funds available um, that we're able to bid against as well. Um, so we recently um, sort of went out to get an estimate for replacing all the lighting in our buildings, for example. Um, so yes, that, that did come at a cost. Um, we are aware of a fund uh, funding being available. Um, it's capital, we can bid against that, so we probably will do that um, within the next couple of months. Um, as opposed to um, bigger costs going forward and Claire may want to comment on this but because of our lease arrangements I think I think there's a limit to what we can actually do um, in our buildings um, I think remaining actions such as you know maybe switching to electric vehicles for our fleet you know it is manageable within the budget and and can be managed going forward if you like so any sort of uh, it, you know, outset costs will be managed, you know, by ongoing savings going forward. So, I, Claire, I don't know if there's anything you yeah. want to add on that. So, so there's a couple of things. One is, you know, we, we in the short to medium term as part of our capital plan, we didn't identify any significant capital requirements going forward. Um, however, what we are trying to understand oh. is what does our footprint look like in a mobile, modern, digital environment and I don't think we've got the answer to that yet David it's something that we're working on as a collective to understand what does that mean and what does that translate with and do we need the footprint we've got or does it become smaller or does it have a different use and I think that's the step changes that we can make from our sort of building use but as you can see from our our CO2 footprint our biggest driver is actually procurement and and for me that 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 again is probably not requiring investment, it's probably requiring an investment in understanding what that means from a scope one to a scope three and, and what things can we do to influence that. Um, so I think in a short to medium term, I don't foresee a, 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 a high requirement for funding at this point. If anything, it's probably looking at what can we do to actually generate a reduced footprint, which actually might generate some savings, albeit what does that mean and does that actually work for us? And I don't think we're there yet with that. Um, Julie and I are working on the strategy for estates, so the future strategy for estates, to try and understand what that, that thinking is. Um, but this is the analysis is certainly very helpful in understanding and having that insight. I think for the first um, 12 months, as Julie's right, we've put in for additional funding to address the lighting issue that we currently have within uh, um, Tiglan or Avon. Um, but it's really minor compared to some of the other requirements we might need. Um, but we're, it's, it's work in progress, isn't it? We know we now know what we didn't know. And as, as we more, knew, know more, we'll adapt and respond to that requirement going forward, really. Thank you, uh, Claire, for putting that in in, in context uh, and just bringing up to speed uh, with your plans for the uh, estate strategy also. Um, I've got another question from Ruth. Uh, thank you. Um, Claire largely picked up on the point I was going to make about procurement. Um, it, it, you know, I think it's it's clear to see that the pandemic has had an impact on our emissions from an estate's perspective, um, although it, it's less clear what the associated increase in each of our individual staff's um, carbon emissions has been through working from home more. Um, 
it, but actually that's a that's a tiny proportion of where we actually need to get involved which is around our procurement uh, and something about us being system leaders in that space as a digital organization is where we really need to be where we really need to be thinking and it, it you know you know I think you're right, Claire. It's not about additional funding. It's probably about completely different ways of of, of cutting that cake, isn't it? So thank you. Uh, thank you for the report, Julie. It was uh, really helpful information. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, nothing else that you want to add, Claire, at this point before I draw the discussion to a close? No, I suppose he, Ruth's right. And I think the other bit for me is who knows what's going to happen with the forthcoming energy crisis and energy costs and how that will change people's behavior and how that will influence us as an organization and also with the fuel so i think we are i suppose from a digital perspective we have to be agile and 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 react and respond um and consider all those impacts as we move forward so trying to do a longer term strategy in the face of that is really difficult. I know Julie and I are struggling a bit, but um, yeah, so we'll keep the audit committee posted as as and when we see the developments and respond accordingly, really. We hope we can afford to turn on all those lovely new light bulbs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, as you say, there are so many unknowns at this current point in time. So thank you, Julie, and thank you, Claire, for um, that uh, insight. Uh, so the committee then notes the uh, estates uh, and the environmental health and safety report uh, and thank the team for producing the information and the data that stands uh, behind uh, this report. So that brings us to the uh, final few minutes of uh, our agenda this morning. Um, the committee highlight report to board. Um, there are a number of very positives I think we can report uh, to board. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but just to note the progress, the very positive progress we've seen on the uh, audit action log. Um, we've endorsed the Welsh language uh, compliance uh, and improvement framework, and uh, we've heard about the plan in place to uh, 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 advertise jobs bilingually, uh, the standards of behaviour report, um, that policy uh, uh, and the awareness raising that will take place with regard to that policy. We uh, welcome the quality and regulatory annual report, our first, noting some key achievements. Uh, there's the baseline governance action plan progress report, and there are some uh, uh, very positive actions arising from uh, the action plan that Chris uh, highlighted and uh, some of the key issues we've just discussed in the estates and compliance report. So uh, I will work on that uh, with uh, Chris to report to the board, which meets at the end of this month. Uh, I, I just wondered whether there's any specific point that anybody else wanted me to include within that uh, report to board if there is uh, and uh, please if you think of anything that uh, specifically you'd like uh, me to draw attention do please uh, let me know within the next couple of days if you would colleagues so uh, in terms of any other urgent business then uh, nothing has been reported so uh, unless there is any other pressing business, which I can't see from uh, any nods around the table, I uh, shall bring this meeting to a close. The, uh, this is the fourth meeting we've held actually in this financial year, which is probably a first compared with last year. Uh, so uh, make no apologies for uh, managing to bring this meeting uh, to a close slightly early. Uh, we've made good time and good progress and uh, our next meeting will be held on the 18th of October. So uh, thank you all for your engagement and for your contributions and I'd like just like to commend Claire and the team, all our colleagues in DHCW for the quality of the papers we've received uh, this morning. They, they've truly been excellent and we're seeing uh, a, a traction of progress going from quarter to quarter. So I'd like to put on record our appreciation to Claire and all the team for the excellent uh,
papers that have been presented today. So wish you well um, and look forward to seeing you, some of you at board and others uh, at our next uh, pre-meet for our October audit meeting. Thank you and goodbye.